everybody would like to call back to order the Board of Supervisors budget hearings for last day. It is June 13th at 1.30 p.m. If we could have a roll call, please. Certainly. Supervisor Koenig? Here. Cummings? Here. Hernandez? Absent. McPherson? Absent. Friend? Here. Um, Mr. Palacios, are there any changes to today's agenda for the budget hearings? Uh, yes, we had, uh, Supervisor McPherson has um, asked to appear remotely under AB 2449 due to recent knee surgery. Uh, request that the board add item 3.1 to the agenda and take up the item to approve his remote appearance. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Is there any comments from the community? I don't see any in chambers. Anybody online? No speakers online, Chair. All right. If we could have a roll call, please, too. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Friend? Aye. That passes unanimously. Well, now, uh, is there a motion to allow Bruce, uh, excuse me, Supervisor McPherson, to join the meeting remotely? So moved. Second. Is there anybody from, I see nobody in chambers that's here to speak to us. Anybody online on this item? <clears throat> All right. I'll bring it back for a roll call. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Friend? Aye. All right, that passes unanimously. We'll welcome Supervisor McPherson back to the meeting uh, remotely. Thank you. All right. So are there any other changes to today's agenda, Mr. Palacios? There are no further changes. Thank you. I'd like to note Supervisor Hernandez is present and would like to open up for public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda, but within the purview of the Board of Supervisors or also uh, on the regular agenda items today, should you be unable to stay. Welcome back, good afternoon. Thank you, good afternoon. My name is Becky Steinberger. I want to just uh, speak to the difficulty that the public has had throughout this, but this year's budgeting uh, process in accessing information, detailed information that is valuable and helps us understand the budget, the expenses, the revenues, so that we can participate in an informed manner. I have brought to your attention that there is a problem with the public website. Normally, I, I have always <laughs> gone in through the, the board calendar portal to get information, and that site remains broken. I understand there are other ways but the fact that the broken website calendar portal, which many members of the public have relied on historically is broken. And I ask that you just remove it. If it's not gonna get fixed, it's been broken for over two weeks. If it's not gonna get fixed, just take it off the website. And that will lead people more to be inclined to click on the agendas and minutes, which, I always thought was uh, the way to get to the archived documents. And it's only been recently pointed out to me that you can also obviously go to current information. So I did um, send your board a cure and correct demand letter. And I still want you to pay attention to this. I haven't received a response yet, but it's been very difficult for the public to really participate. Um, these are very abbreviated hearings. Um, they're a month early. And there was nothing in the evening in Watsonville, as has always been done. So I don't understand why that has happened. But I'd like you to pay attention and maybe do a better job of trying to get information out and include the public in an informed discussion manner. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers that would like to address us during public comment? Madam Clerk, is there anybody online during public comment? Yes, Chair. ZH, your microphone is now available. ZH, user ZH, if you will accept the unmute and begin speaking. 
Oh, my apologies. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry about that. Um, supervisors, thanks for having some space for public comment today. Um, my name is Zav Hirschfield. I'm the program coordinator for an organization called Tenant Sanctuary. And I apologize for any background noise on my end today. I'm, uh, I'm working outdoors today at my other job. Um, but I wanted to thank you for considering um, the addition of some money in the county budget for uh, legal representation for tenants. Um, my organization is an education and counseling organization questions about uh, their rights under state and local laws. Um, we speak to 300 or so uh, individual households each year, uh, issues ranging from security deposit theft to illegal rent increases to evictions. Um, and we help people understand sort of what the law says about the situation that they're in. Um, there's a serious lack though, uh, we're in, in situations where uh, it's fairly clear from our understanding of the situation and the tenant's understanding of the situation that uh, perhaps their landlord is doing something that's prohibited by law, but uh, actually enforcing that law requires an attorney to, uh, to uh, uh, represent the tenant affirmatively. And the vast majority of people who are contacting us are low income uh, and cannot afford uh, to hire an attorney out of their own out of their own pocket. And with with incredible respect to the work that other legal aid organizations in this county do, most of them do not uh, represent tenants in an affirmative capacity, um, mostly in a defensive capacity. Um, so we're grateful. Just speaking on behalf of the organization here, we're grateful to the board for recognizing the need for additional uh, legal representation and support for tenants. Um, you know, without which uh, the laws that the county has on the books, such as the recently passed anti-retaliation ordinance, uh, you know, would not be enforced. So we're grateful to the county for um, taking the step forward and making sure that its own laws are enforced and that the laws of the state of California are enforced and that, you know, renters living in, in, in the communities in this county are, um, have the support that they need. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else online? No further speakers, Chair. Okay, that will close public comment. We'll bring it to the first item of the regular agenda. We're very fortunate today to have a presentation on the 2022 California State Association of Counties Challenge Awards as recommended by the CAO. Carlos, excuse me, Mr. Palacios, do you have an introduction to this item before I introduce our distinguished member from CSAC that's here today? Uh, I just wanna thank um, CSAC for this uh, recognition. Uh, it's a very, um, great thing to happen for our staff and recognizing their hard work that they do throughout the year. And also want to thank the Board of Supervisors for your support. Thank you. I'd like to introduce uh, Jacqueline Wong Hernandez, who is the CSAC Chief Policy Officer of Legislative Affairs. We're very fortunate to have you. You do amazing work on our behalf uh, in Sacramento and across the state. So thank you for taking the time to come down to our community. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Chair Friend, for allowing me to join the board and staff here today. Um, as uh, Chair Friend just said, I'm Jacqueline Wong Hernandez, the Chief Policy Officer for the California State Association of Counties. Um, Santa Cruz County has always been a strong member within CSAC and really want to thank Supervisor McPherson for his steadfast um, leadership and service to the CSAC Board of Directors, um, as well as Chair Friend for carving out time to chair our Health and Human Services um, Committee, Policy Committee, and occasionally running up to Sacramento to testify um, before the legislature on behalf of all counties. I'd also like to recognize the help of Dr. Robert Ratner, your Housing for Health Director, who has been an immense help on our at-home um, homelessness issues. He was a member of our Homelessness uh, Policy Solutions Group, and Dr. Ratner, in that capacity, informed the conversation, provided essential data, and generally helped steer us in the right direction from day one with our policies. He's played a key role in the development of the CSAC at home plan. And on behalf of all counties, we want to thank him and thank the County of Santa Cruz um, for your commitment. 
Um, but homelessness is not all we focus on um, because there are many issues uh, important to to counties and and we're here for all of them. The association has been around since 1895 and our mission is to serve counties and advocate at the state and federal levels on behalf of all counties and that never wavers um, in all of the issues. Um, and so today here, I have the distinct pleasure of being able to recognize the Santa Cruz County's hard work um, and spirit of innovation with two CSAC Challenge Awards. Our Challenge Awards program was developed more than 20 years ago to spotlight the most innovative and effective community programs in counties. Um, in 2022, CSAC received more than 300 Challenge Award entries, and we awarded just 18. Um, and two of them are here with me today for Santa Cruz County. Um, the bar was high, but our judging panel quickly identified um, these particular programs as rising above the rest. Um, and so I'll begin with the Santa Cruz County budget website. Our judges were impressed by the county's commitment to transparency and efficiency, which gave rise to the county budget website. Before developing this highly interactive website, county staff and community members had to comb through more than 60,000 pages annually to understand how and where county revenues were spent. So the county administration office and the information service department collaborated on an easy to use website that turned the static budget book into an integrated, accurate and accessible website. Now, the county budget website not only displays the most updated figures, but also links to the county's operational and strategic plans and priorities. It links them to those figures. The public can now see the connections between spending, staffing, and overall county objectives. Users can also see totals, descriptions, funded staff, and emerging issues within each department and follow related links to. I don't know if you all know how special this is, but we see a lot of county websites and state websites, and this is pretty special. For example, a public defender emerging issue links to a partnering nonprofit site that provides supplemental services. A GIS feature allows users to enter an address within the county to see the services associated with that address, including supervisor representation, county maintained roads, and nearby park facilities. It's translatable, it works on mobile devices. Someday we will have a website that works on mobile devices in my organization. Um, and it allows for real-time updates um, and feedback. And this is what really impressed the judges. Um, Santa Cruz County is the first county to, to integrate its operational plan, objectives, and priorities within a budget site. Um, you all should be very proud of that. It improves the transparency and builds more public trust, all while being replicable and scalable for all counties. So it's my pleasure to present a 2022 Challenge Award to Santa Cruz County for your budget website. Thank you all. For the second award, we turn to an issue that all counties are grappling with, which is transparency and trust in local public safety. Against the backdrop of a national conversation about police policies and procedures, Santa Cruz County worked with local public safety agencies to complete the first regional comparative review of use of force, technology, and privacy policies and procedures in the country. The resulting report provides a comparative snapshot of key policies and procedures in Santa Cruz County law enforcement agencies. 
It's important to note that all agencies participated voluntarily and openly, and multiple agencies updated and modernized their policies regarding use of force, technology, oversight, and privacy as a result. The Santa Cruz County Regional Public Safety Agency Policy Review and Analysis, it's a very long name, um, is, a publicly available, is publicly available and serves as a template for other counties to improve transparency and build the public's trust in local law enforcement. We understand that the project required hard work and collaboration among many agencies and organizations, but that it originated with Chair Friend and with this board's strong commitment to transparency. I want to congratulate Santa Cruz County um, for earning a 2022 CSAC Challenge Award for the Santa Cruz County Regional Public Safety Agency Policy Review and Analysis Report. Thank you all for your work. Thank you all. Uh, Chair Friend. Please, Supervisor McPherson, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, and uh, congratulations. Uh, as was mentioned, as the member of the CSAC board, uh, I want to thank uh, Ms. Uh, Wong Hernandez for being here today. Uh, I don't know that the people of Santa Cruz County can recognize what a big deal this is uh, she said for 58 counties, uh, 300 entries, only 18 awarded, and we're getting two of them in very, very, probably the most important sectors of our budget. Well, I don't know if that could be said, but very important sectors of our budget. Um, the, the Thanks to our, our budget team led by Mark Ben Mattel to integrate um, how we work things here, how the public can really, uh, we can translate the very dense document that uh, is hundreds of pages long into an online format. It's not easily done. And I'm sure uh, we're gonna make uh, an effort to make it even better. Uh, it's truly a, a phenomenal, our budget website is really a, a, just a phenomenal achievement for Santa Cruz County. Um, and the CSAC awards uh, also for the Criminal Justice uh, Council, which uh, Chair Friend, you were very much involved with. And uh, as and I, I, I think it was very proper that uh, Supervisor Cummings was there because he was on the council. It was a coordinated effort between our law enforcement agencies throughout the county to uh, just how we can have justice partners uh, and receiving this statewide recognition for community policing. Uh, it's not the first time we've been recognized for something like this, and I'm sure it won't be the last, but the, the important thing is we're at the top of the line, the front of the line in getting these types of awards. And I think everybody in the Santa Cruz County community, the employees, uh, and everybody who works so diligently on these two projects in particular should be very proud of these achievements. So thank you very much. And uh, let's go after more next year. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Thank you for your service also on the board of CSAC. Any other uh, comments, Supervisor Cummings? Yeah, I just want to um, thank again and commend the county staff for all their hard work, um, especially as it relates to the budget portal. Um, seeing that this year, it's a little daunting and overwhelming to try to start diving into that, but um, it uh, definitely has provided higher level of transparency. And um, over time, I'm sure we're all gonna get used to it a little bit more and more, but um, uh, it was great to be able to, you know, uh, have some assistance with navigating that from um, Marcus Pimentel. And um, I know moving forward that as the community um, really starts to understand how they can use this website, it's really gonna make um, reviewing the budget a lot more transparent, a lot more, and a lot easier too. So just wanna thank you all for that. Um, and this award is a, is a testament to those achievements that you all have made. Um, and then I just wanna thank, um, Chair Friend, when I was mayor of Santa Cruz in 2020, um, as we all saw with the murder of George Floyd, there was a lot of social unrest uh, throughout the nation and even here within our community. And as I started having meetings with members of the black community in particular here in Santa Cruz, they said that what they really cared about was understanding how the laws differ between the various locations that you're in within Santa Cruz County and really trying to see consistency in laws across the county. And um, at that time, I 
approached uh, Chair Friend as the chair of the Criminal Justice Council, who was able to take this to the board and get unanimous support for us to move forward with this study. And I know that it was his leadership that really, and his relationships with all the law enforcement agencies that really helped us to be able to bring everyone together um, in a way that was collaborative and really helped us move this uh, report forward. And so I just want to thank Chair Friend for his um, willingness to take this on. And it really is uh, a great achievement for us to see that we're the first county in the entire nation to do that. And when we mention that to folks, they they are oftentimes very shocked to hear that that's the case. And so I hope that more counties throughout our country do these types of studies so that we can make sure that um, people are being treated fairly by the law and that it's consistent um, across our regions. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings. Any other comments from board members? I, I would just like to take a second to acknowledge uh, CSAC. California State Association of Counties is not Necessarily known outside of the county structure, very well known though within yeah. the state legislative structure, and I can't um, I can't sp speak highly enough about their work and being able to advocate on our behalf, uh, especially during budget time when a lot of the challenges that that oh, I mean all state budget challenges end up becoming county budget challenges, mm -hmm. and so without their voice there every single day in Sacramento, asking us also to be advocates teaching us how to be the best advocates. Uh, they're very well trusted. When you speak to state legislators, when you speak to the governor's office, they do trust the voice of CSAC. Jacqueline, you're a, you're a great leader there. And we um, a lot of people have services and funding and access because of the work that you're doing up there. So just know that it directly translates to communities like ours. So thank you to CSAC for their work. Is there anybody in the community that would like to address us on this item? It's a non-action item, but it is a presentation item. So if anybody would like to spec, uh, step forward, you're welcome to. I uh, see none in chambers. Is there anybody online? The speaker's online. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, have a safe drive back to Sacramento. We appreciate you come doing the trip down here for us. We'll now move on to item six, which is to a public hearing to consider a resolution approving amendments to the unified fee schedule for fiscal year 23-24, including the addendum as provided in the reference budget documents and as recommended by the county administrative officer. We have the budget hearings board memo and a resolution amending unified fee schedule with exhibits A and B. Uh, Mr. Pimentel, are you leading this one? Yeah. Thank you. So I'm grateful to be presenting to you today, Chair Friend, Board of Supervisors, the conclusion of our four days budget hearings, beginning you know with the CSAC awards, moving into our public hearing for a unified fee schedule. So before you before you today in the and included in the in the board packet is a uh, our routine updates to our unified fee schedule. Twice a year, June and December, we provide departments the opportunity to present consolidated updates to our unified fee schedule. These are very routine in nature. Um, and the board of documents and exhibits include a lot more details than we'll cover here today. I'm here today with our department's associate administrative and now, uh, and now, and analyst, Mate Ars, uh, who led our efforts to compile the request from departments for a unified fee schedule. Uh, this hearing today is to consider adopting the resolution to amend the 23-24 unified fee schedule as included in our supplemental recommendations as detailed in the departmental budget hearings and their board reports and included in our proposed 23-24 budget. Following this brief staff presentation, we'll ask the board to open the public hearing, take testimony, public comments, close the public hearing, and adopt the resolution to amend the unified fee schedule. As I mentioned, these are typically very routine in nature. Um, the left hand of the screen are, are typical reasons that there might be changes in the unified fee schedule, mostly related to cost increases, whether they're consumer price index CPI changes or increases in, in projected costs for the county. There's also occasionally prior board directed items, and we do have those here this time. Um, there's often fees that are not yet included in our unified fee schedule. So the unified fee schedule is an opportunity to have one spot shot where one place where all our fees live. It's an it's a, it's a it's a value add to the county. So we often find fees that need to move up to that level, um, or that there's changes in in state mandated or codes or regulations, or often as there are this time, some fees that are no longer applicable. Examples of some fees included in the board report, included in the detailed exhibits, um, include last year there was some new fees added for underground storage tanks, um, tanks 
uh, sites with one, two, three, four, and six tanks, but not five. So this time we're adding that fifth, when you have five tanks underground, that fee should have been there. That was just um, excluded. There are some board directed fees that came out of a, a November, December discussion uh, related to tiny homes. Those are now being added in following a board direction. And as I mentioned, routine cost increases built into a consumer price index, county costs, community development and infrastructure is also county fire. Across the board, there are 10 departments proposing fee increases. Um, and we have some minor updates for some fees that um, are not there, for example, in the assessor recorder and auditor controller and the Santa Cruz County Sanitation, Sanitation District. Some of the other departments including that are including fee increases um, include general services, health services, human services, information services, and parks, open space, and cultural services. Again, the board reports detail these, um, summarize these, and there's exhibits that have a detailed listing of all the fees and the, the current fee and the proposed new increase. So with that, that concludes our presentation. We do have uh, departmental staff here who, if there are any questions, otherwise, um, turn it back to the board. Thank you, Mr. Bimentel. It's pretty self-explanatory, but are there any questions from my colleagues on this item? Um, Supervisor McPherson, I can't see you, but did you have any questions yeah. on this item? No questions. I might have a comment in, in a minute. Perfect. And now I'd like to open, this is a uh, public hearing. We'd like to open up the public hearing. Is there any member of the community that would like to address us in chambers on this public hearing, during this public hearing? Good afternoon, welcome back. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I have a question for Mr. Pimentel. You just mentioned that there are new fees for county fire. I have the unified schedule here in front of me. Um, are those related to plan checks at all? Um, are there any additional questions? I want to make sure you get them in and then we'll, well that's my that's my question because um, I do attend the County Fire Department Advisory Commission meetings and it was announced that um, County Fire was going to contract out their fire, uh, their plan inspections for fire and would no longer be doing it in house. So I'm just curious, I've tried to find that in here, but if you can refer me to a page where I can find that information, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers? Seeing none, is there anybody online? Okay, we'll close the public hearing, but there was a question that was posed during the public hearing, uh, Mr. Pimentel. Yeah, within the board packet, uh, within this particular item, page six, but uh, packet page 15 uh, details the four uh, fees, or three fee uh, building plan check and inspection of square footage rates that are going up. Okay. Um, we'll bring it back to the board of supervisor McPherson. You said you had a comment. Yeah, I just wanted to thank, as I, th I know each supervisor would, uh, for the hard work of each of our departments to put this budget together under the leadership of Mark and Mattel. Um, and, and hopefully we're going to have greater clarity in the coming weeks and months about the status of our federal reimbursement uh, from our disaster requests. And I hope our revenue projections continue to hold throughout the year. Um, a significant part of the budget is, of course, our county personnel, without whom uh, we could not provide the core services to our community. They have gone above and beyond the call of duty under some very trying circumstances, as we all know. I just want to thank them for allowing us to provide the services we do and what the public expects of us uh, under some very trying circumstances. Uh, so I just want to thank them for their hard work throughout the year and their dedication to public service. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion? Move approval of the unified fee schedule. We have a motion from Supervisor Koenig and a second from Supervisor Cummings. No additional comments. So we'll get a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. And that passes unanimously. We'll move on to item seven, which is, is the Board of um, I think it's actually as the board of directors of the, of the Santa Cruz County Redevelopment Successor Agency authorized the auditor controller with the concurrence of the county administrative officer to make the necessary year end adjustments and adjustments for the 23-24 due to increases and decreases in available financing and approve the 23-24 redevelopment successor agency proposed budget as recommended by the CAO. We have the budget hearings item board memo and the proposed budget. 
with line item details, Mr. Pimentel. This will be short and brief. There, are, This is very routine in nature. There are no changes from the board's action on January 17th when they uh, adopted the 23-24 administrative budget for the redevelopment successor agency and approved the uh, the ROPS, the recognized obligation payment schedule. So there are no changes from that January 17th action. Therefore, we're presenting to you the same budget um, as, as presented then. Thank you. No changes. No questions, it appears. I would like to open it up to the community. Are there any questions on this item, item seven? I see none in chambers. Is there anybody online? We have no speakers online, Chair. Okay, we'll close public comment on item seven. Is there a motion? I'll move the recommended actions. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Cummings and a second from Supervisor Hernandez. We could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Conan? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. Now it gets exciting. Mm -hmm. Item eight is to consider approval of the 2324 County of Santa Cruz proposed budget concluding actions, approve the continuing agreements list for 2324, authorize the auditor controller with the concurrence of the county administrative officer to make necessary year end adjustments and adjustments for 2223 due to increases and decreases in available financing, approve the 2324 County of Santa Cruz proposed budget, including concluding report items and take related actions as recommended by the CAO. We have the budget hearings item memo, the financial update, the errata, the proposed 23-24 budget, including line item detail and the continuing agreements list. Uh, Mr. Pimentel. Thank you. I think you've done my job for me, but that was very well done. Um, board chair and board members uh, annually to close out our public, bu our public budget hearing process and the proposed budget hearing process. Um, we tradition prepare a concluding report. This is the including report that's included in the board packet. It summarizes the supplemental actions that were presented uh, to the board on May uh, 25th. It summarizes the hearings, the departmental budget hearings, and any last day changes that came out of those budget hearings. Um, and any concluding actions that are cleanup in nature also often work with our partners in the auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector's office. Um, this report also provides uh, a summary of the actions required to close out this current year and prepare the proposed budget for adoption on September 19th to be considered for adoption. Some order magnitude changes in, in the budget include in, in the last day, we had $2.1 million of expenditures and uh, added to the budget $404 million uh, countywide. These are all grant, largely grant related, and some new state and federal grants that were received by departments that were included in. So revenue went up, expenditure went up. Um, in the preliminary concluding actions, we've, we've took some actions to reconcile already some of the 22-23 costs. The net result is um, a slight increase in our general fund contribution of 360,000. So our, our general fund is putting into the budget 360,000 more between those two actions. We have very small differences on the, on the face of a $1.1 billion, billion budget and a $739 million general fund budget. Those details are summarized in the exhibits. They're summarized in the concluding reports um, and a lot more information is there. What I'll go into is just wrapping up what's coming next. And I wanna conclude with some thanks and appreciation. Um, following, as I mentioned today, closes out the public hearing process. Our next actions are to work with our auditor controller to treasure tax collector's office um, to prepare and present the 23-24 budget for adoption. On September 19th, this adopted budget is developed uh, with strict mandates and guidelines by the state of California. So you'll see a budget that looks quite different than, than what you've seen online, but it's in conformity with state requirements. And then we'll subsequently following board approval and adoption on September 19th, so the auto controller treasurer tax collector will submit that to the state. So before taking action, concluding my presentation, I do wanna um, express some real Sincere gratitude this year. Every year is a, is a moment of opportunity to thank a lot of people behind the scenes who, who you don't see. Um, the CSAC award is just a, a, a touch of, of recognizing the excellence that I've seen across county staff and department heads um, and this, this particular office and your board, this board and your staff. Um, we all know that this particular budget cycle has been incredibly challenging. It began during a three month ongoing a dual disaster event that started on uh, the eve of New Year's Eve, December 30th, and continued through the month of March. And many of our departments who are the biggest departments responsible for the most complicated budgets 
had their same budget staff devoted to response recovery efforts. This office in particular had our staff devoted to response and recovery efforts. There are many of our staff who would typically have worked on the budget were deployed in, in the EOC or supporting the event. So it was a very tough budget cycle and we all know that. Um, so I, it's just with deepest gratitude that I wanna uh, express my appreciation and support to this board. Um, your staff were incredible to work with. Uh, th these were testing trying times. Um, And I'm proud to say successful from a process standpoint. We produced an on-time budget that's balanced. Um, all departments were prepared and ready to go for the budget hearings. Um, I'm just really proud about how this cycle finished. Um, when we were in the middle of it in January, February, it was hard to see an end that, that looked smooth. And, and yet it, it got there. And I think it's to the dedication of people who are putting in 70, 80, 90 hours in a week to make sure they were doing all their dual or triple duties. Um, getting down to some specific things, I really want to acknowledge our clerk of the board that her, um, her and her staff have just been fantastic to work with into a challenging year, into a new role. Um, it's, it's been seamless and, and they've been very well prepared and have helped us behind the scenes more than, than anybody will ever see. So I just want to express my appreciation to Juliet, her former staff, Jackie West, current staff, Lisa, um, uh, Helen Bailey, everybody that's just been phenomenal to work with. It's been uh, our entire, my entire pleasure and I think all of us have appreciated working with you. Also our CO team, your CO team is often behind the scenes. Every once in a while you see them presenting something or participating in something or sitting beside a presentation. Um, they were all responding to the event, um, many of the events. They continue to work in response and recovery efforts. They continue to do other things. Um, so it's just, I, I'm really proud of um, beginning with our principal administrative analyst, Sven Stafford and Peter Detlis. Sven was, I was talking to, uh, 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 He's act a little before the presentation. There was a mo moment in December 2021 when Sven came to a meeting with a sketch of what our online web website would look like. He said, hey, I had a thought last night, so I sketched it out. And from December 2021, you know, we now have an award-winning website. And Sven was instrumental in just the passion that he brought to what might we do better than we think we can do. And our whole team just got into that spirit. And it was really inspiring to see how that worked. Um, our senior administrative analyst, Brian Friedrich, who just took a charge on let's 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 start preparing a really powerful capital projects management system and, and a system that you'll start seeing um, incredible benefits in the years to come. And we've built the framework for it, and it's going to be really phenomenal going forward. Um, Rita Sanchez, who this year is is doing dual duties, um, one of our key analysts who would have been there, you know, sitting by my side many times, helping with the budget, is out on leave. So Rita took on uh, that job in addition to many other jobs. And I've just been really impressed with her stepping into it with a can-do attitude. And uh, while under pressure, uh, never showing the pressure. Uh, Dave Brown, you know, one of our analysts, he's just a, a voice of reason and calm. I just walk into his office, he calms me down just by looking at him. Uh, you just got some incredible staff there. And I, I, I want to button this up because I could stay here for a long time. It's just been, it's been a, a tough year, but I've been really impressed by the nature of our, of our team. Uh, Mike Dearte, who's standing beside me, sitting beside me, um, just also an incredibly competent woman who um, I respect a lot. Um, and then even just our executive secretary, Danita, Danita, who is scheduling all these meetings. You'll never know that. She's scheduling all these meetings, working with department heads, getting the presentations, um, helping us put that on place and just did that so expertly in her first year. And our minister, administrative aide, Amika White, who behind the, behind the scenes was also helping uh, populate the website, often with about 30 minutes heads up. Hey, Amika, we need this up. Can you get this going? And uh, it was just uh, incredible. I, I'm just really impressed with the entire team. Um, I'll summarize with it's really important in, in to acknowledge our IT team behind us who built this website on their own from scratch, um, led by our IT director, uh, Tammy Weigel. Um, but our employee award winners, you've already recognized them this year, their work was incredible. Tom Mel Melkonian and, and Yan, Yan Chang, Chang. Um, they were just incredible to work with, always responsive, even on weekends, uh, helping us get stuff done. Um, and then our own auditor controller, treasurer, tax collector team led by Edith and her staff, Laura Bowers, Trevor McGuire, McGuire, Brian Howard, and Tracy Turner, all of them, and so many other staff behind the scenes, but they've always played huge roles in helping us get through this because we had a, we were all sprinting this year. So it's just with that, I, I want to also recognize your, uh, and our CAO, Carlos Palacios, who is taking and always a leadership role in what might we do better across our whole community. Um, it's, it's an honor to work with him, with our assistant CAOs, Elisa Benson and Nicole Coburn, 
our deputy CEO, Melody Serino, their collective vision and inspiration and passion is, is infectious and, and sometimes exhausting, but it's, it's infectious. And we, we get a lot more done than I, th I think any other county our size will ever get done. Um, finally, I want to thank this, thank this board, uh, Chair Friend, your staff, uh, the board members, and you and all of your staff. Um, it's been really great working with you. Um, we appreciate all the time, the questions, and the feedback. It's helped us be, be better even during the cycle, made some mid-cycle pivots to help improve our information. So I'm just really grateful, that in particular this year with all the other challenges, um, struggling with FEMA, and yet you all have our backs and are helping us get our FEMA reimbursements and knocking on every door that you can find. Um, and then advocating for us to return our uh, funding back to this community. You know, we've talked about that. We're systematically underfunded. And, and I know all of you are individually looking at how you might help us cure some of those things. It might take, might take a while, but without starting, we will never get there. So just, I know that was a long, longer than I planned. I'm just, I'm really grateful for that we're here today with a really sound, balanced, uh, responsible, yet austere, but impressive budget. Thank you, Mr. Pimentel. Um, your excitement for budget and numbers is infectious. Um, you too, Mr. Skull, I must say. Um, is there, are there any additional, uh, I think that uh, the CA also had some concluding remarks before we bring it back to the board. Um, yes, I wanted to um, make a special note of thanks to the county department heads uh, for their cooperation in developing this budget. Uh, we have come to the board for many years now, including this year, with a unified recommendation for approval from every department head. And uh, that includes not only those who report to me, which is obviously easier to get their agreement, uh, but includes those who are elected and those who are appointed. Um, this does not happen in every county, let me tell you. Uh, there are many uh, counties across the state that have food fights every budget session with department heads at uh, arguing with each other, arguing with the CAO, with the electeds arguing. Uh, and so we have something special here where uh, people uh, recognize that we're part of the same team. Uh, there's a lot of give and take, there's a lot of back and forth, but we ultimately come back to you with a unified recommendation for approval. Uh, but there's a lot of work, let me tell you, to get to that point. And so I wanna thank uh, my staff, but also uh, the department heads. Uh, also wanna thank uh, your board, uh, the board has been incredibly uh, visionary in your approach to the budget. Um, you haven't taken a micromanaging point of view as some uh, councils and boards you know, do. Um, you take a big picture view on policy. And I know today uh, we got an award from uh, CSAC on our budget and our, uh, ultimately on our strategic plan and operational plan. And that uh, idea, that vision ultimately came from the board. You started it. Um, I remember when I first was appointed, um, a Supervisor Friend and Supervisor Coonerty um, uh, took me to go uh, to Salt Lake City to go view their budget, which had an operational plan and a strategic plan and talked about how could we do that. Uh, and we got a really good presentation. And ultimately, it's amazing that we have a better project now than they do. <laughs> That's uh, seven years later, but it's gotten where it's better. Um, and I, I know that you have also taken a lead on our housing for health, um, you know, wanting to um, present that um, office and prepare that office also in our OR3. You've taken a policy lead. Um, and we do face some very difficult issues ahead. As you know, uh, the, some of the main issues we face as a community policy issues is workforce, um, both retention and recruitment. And it's going to be a very difficult. Thing as we continue to go forward, because as we know, we live in the second most unaffordable county in the whole country when you combine housing prices to median wages. And so it's a big challenge for us. And I know that you have been very supportive in our initiatives to address that issue. Um, second, I know that uh, housing and affordable housing and workforce housing are big issues for us. And you've been very supportive as we've uh, attempted to, um, to address those issues as well. And then today, this morning, you know, we, we had something that was very specific, a hearing on something that was a very specific issue, but ultimately it's related to climate change. All of this is at its core climate change. I mean, that's what's causing all of these conflicts um, and we're going to have more of them. So I really want to thank your board because I know that the board has taken an active interest in us addressing climate change as well. So I want to thank you, uh, your leadership and, and these important policy areas and thank you for your support and uh, passing a budget that was uh, somewhat difficult. We absorbed over 20, $12 million of increased costs just to uh, our MOUs that we signed 
uh, more than a, a couple of years ago. So it shows you that uh, just to absorb that was a challenge and not have any cuts, uh, but we were able to do it and keep not only our budget intact, but to provide new initiatives as well. So thank you very much board. And I would also uh, want to thank the staff as Marcus did, who did all the, the, the detailed work, which was very, very difficult. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments by board members before we open it up for the community and then bring it back for action? Supervisor Koenig. Sure, yeah, I'd just also like to take the opportunity to thank all the staff that put this budget together. I mean, as our CEO said, it happened remarkably smoothly for a $1.12 billion budget. Uh, and I know that all the work that went into making our budget digital first, uh, you know, we, we didn't do it to win an award, uh, although it was really nice to have that. Um, and I think as was also suggested by budget manager Pimentel, it's uh, wow, is it a good thing that we did do that? Because as we deal with these increased pressures, dealing, um, you know, responding to disasters, um, I think it was only because of the streamlined budget process that we've created that, uh, as said, all our all our county staff were able to balance, um, you know, the requirements of putting together this budget with working around the clock to responding to those disasters. So um, I think it's a, a good lesson going forward to look for these increased efficiencies as well, because um, what seems like, you know, maybe going over the top uh, today will actually be what saves us tomorrow. Um, I also, as has been pointed out, I think that um, this budget does a great job of responding to um, it's just some of the challenges we face today, uh, increased costs for uh, to keep everyone afloat. Uh, with the increased cost of living in this community and, and supporting our employees, um, you know, managing some of the impacts to our budget from the from the storms as we await FEMA uh, funding, um, and I think there's also stuff in here to be uh, optimistic about for the coming year, whether it's the investment um, in uh, new staffing for uh, the Unified Permit Center um, or in capital facilities like um, the Children's Crisis Residential Treatment Program uh, that we're, we're standing up in Live Oak. Um, or you know, in parks that kids will play in every day, like Floral Park. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm excited about what we're doing here, and I look forward to the year ahead. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings. Did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to thank um, all the county staff for their hard work in this budget, and also for your um, your hard work during the times when we were going through the storms, and we really needed people to step up and help our community during a time of need. And so, just you know, acknowledging the challenges that come with that, and trying to do your normal day-to-day -day job can be really intense. And our county staff step up um, in really significant ways to help support the community and get their own jobs done. So, I just want to um, thank everyone for their hard work during a really challenging time. Um, in addition to that, just want to thank all the department heads, the county CAO, um, for all their work on this. And um, this is my first uh, budget on the county side, um, but having sat through other budgets in the past, I know that sometimes things can get pretty tense with budgeting and uh, this was a really smooth process. And so just want to thank everybody for that. Um, and then just want to acknowledge that, you know, um, moving forward, we're obviously going to have a lot of um, more challenges in the year to come, um, especially as was mentioned by County CAO around retention and recruitment of employees and that coinciding with retirements and how we can continue to maintain the services that we know so many people in our community want to see us provide. Um, in addition to that, as we've seen with multiple disasters back to back, um, really having to expand on our disaster response and recovery efforts is going to be a huge need for us to continue down that route of expanding those programs. And um, as it relates to kind of mental and behavioral health, we know that there's going to be a lot of state unfunded mandates coming our way around care courts and other types of programs. And so really having uh, to be creative in how we're going to be able to stand up some of these programs where uh, the state's not providing us with any funding, but they're trying to mandate that we, we have to um, provide these services. So um, just really looking forward to seeing how we can all work together um, in the years ahead. And then I just, I'll also wanted to um, thank the board and um, our human services department and also um, in particular Supervisor McPherson on the funding for the tenant legal assistance. Um, I know this is something that many people in the community have been wanting to see us um, bring forward and um, what better place than having it at the county level. And so my hope is that we can see how that program 
um, rolls out and see um, what opportunities there are for expanding that moving forward. And so just want to uh, thank everyone for, um, be, for us being able to find the funds to make that happen and um, um, for us to be able to, to start moving forward with providing these services for tenants in our community. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. I'll keep my comments brief. Uh, firstly, we'll thank you, uh, Marcus and Maite, for the presentation. And uh, of course, uh, Carlos as well, and all the CEO's office for this year's um, round of budgets. And also, I want to thank all the departments and staff for their presentations that they've done uh, from parks, public works. And, uh, you know, and we had a in South County in particular, we had a uh, rough start to the year. And so I really want to thank Public Works for all the work that they've done and extended the, their budget for a lot of the damages that have occurred in South County as well. So thank you very much for that as well. Uh, so yes, that concludes my comments. <laughs> Supervisor McPherson, did you have anything to add? Or we open it up for the community? All right, we'll open it up uh, for the community. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on this item. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I, I continue to be worried that nobody's talking about the unfunded CalPERS debt liability. <laughs> and I heard a presentation to the Central Fire District Board by their consultant, and it's pretty scary. And you folks aren't even talking about it. So um, I'd like you to talk about it because it's going to be huge. And in the past, CAO Palacio has said it's, it's almost like a tsunami coming our way. But we're not talking about it here this year. So please talk about it. Um, I, I want to, um, I've, I have focused on county fire budget. That's a big interest of mine living in the rural areas. And I participate in a lot of fire um, agency board meetings. And so I continue to be concerned about um, what I consider a lack of information for county fires budget. Um, I did during the lunch break go to the public computer because this is all we've got for three days of budget hearings out here in the hallway for people without devices. Um, but I'm grateful for the public computer in the lobby. And in the lobby, it says the supplemental amount for county fire budget will be taking away almost $7,000. And then it says the supplemental budget corrects the initial budget by um, of $1 million. And then it talks a little bit if you click on things, and I'm glad you got an award, but I sure hope you make a tutorial for the public. <laughs> Supervisor Cummings, you had the benefit of staff helping shoot you uh, navigate it, but the public has not had that. Um, I clicked on pass-through accounts, which I'm always interested in because that's county fire budget. May I have one more minute, please? Thank you. That's, that's Prop 172, state public safety money that comes to our county every year and county fire gets zero, but it's a pass-through to the County Fire Chief Association. And it calls it a pass-through, but it doesn't explain it. It doesn't define it. It says, though, that it is over $3 million. And um, I, I just feel like there's very little information for the public to understand who may not go to Fire Department Advisory Commission meetings to understand what that is. Moving on, clicking on the page, um, I see that the intra fund transfer for last year was $1.3 million, 2023 24, zero. What? <laughs> um, salaries and uh, employment benefits last year were 183, and this year is less by almost $20,000. Fixed assets. Uh, last year was over $3 million, this year down by $2 million. Uses of property, 
um, continues to concern me because of discussions held at the Fire Department Advisory Commission that County Fire Department is going into the business of providing leasing equipment for Cal Fire to backfill their deficiencies. That concerns me. And I saw that happen at a recent uh, Firewise Board uh, community outreach meeting. Cal Fire showed up in a County Fire engine and there were no County Fire volunteers on that engine. In closing, what I see at the end of the, the budget was revenues versus expenses is a minus three and a half million dollars to County Fire. How can that be? And there was no staff presentation to help me understand that. And uh, given what Chief Nate Armstrong has said, I'm really worried. And I don't feel that we can trust Cal Fire. We don't have their contract. At least I don't see it in here. Can you just conclude, please? So I'm, what I'm saying is that, well, it may be an award-winning budget website. It's not nav very easy to navigate for the public. And I'm concerned about County Fire. And the last comment I want to make is that you are acting as the board of directors for County Fire Department. And as such, I think that your any action that you take, like the public hearing that will be coming up on June 27th, it should be denoted in the agenda that you are taking action as the Thank board. You, of Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Is there anybody else in chambers for this item? Is there anybody online? Okay, we'll bring it back to the board for a motion. Supervisor Cummings. I'll move the recommended action for adoption of the budget. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Cummings and a second from Supervisor Hernandez. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. And Friend. We saw you but didn't hear you one more time, Supervisor McPherson. Excuse me. Aye. Aye, thank you. And I um, also cast a, uh, an, uh, an I vote, and that passes unanimously. I would like to thank everybody for their work on this, and that'll conclude the budget hearings and also conclude our earlier board meeting.
Because we. Recording in progress. June 13, 2023, meeting of the Board of Supervisors. If we could start with a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Here. Friend? Here. Cummings? Here. Hernandez? Present. McPherson is absent at this time. We could begin with a moment of silence. Does anybody like to dedicate this moment of silence? All right, if we could just have a moment of silence, please. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, Mr. Palacios. Are there any changes to today's agenda? Uh, yes, Chair Friend and members of the board, we do have a number of corrections. Item uh, number 16, there, there is additional materials. This is a revised attachment. Packet page 317 is replaced. Consent agenda uh, item should read approved as amended. And then on item number 23, there's additional materials. Revised memo packet page 374 is replaced. Recommended action should read adopt the resolution appointing David Sanford as agricultural commissioner slash sealer of weights and measures. And then item 90, 98, there's additional materials, revised memo, packet page 2273 is replaced. Recommended action number six should read, direct staff to return on or before October 17th, 2023 for the ratification of the award. And then finally, uh, Supervisor uh, McPherson is asking, uh, to appear uh, remotely under AB 2449 uh, due to recent uh, knee surgery. And he is asking the chair to solicit a motion to add the item for his uh, permission to appear remotely as item 3.1 to the agenda. Okay, um, seeing as uh, Supervisor McPherson meets the criteria, is there a motion to uh, add this? So moved. We have a motion from Supervisor Koenig and a second from Supervisor uh, Cummings. Uh, this would just simply add it as an item to the agenda. Is that correct, Council? It would add it as item 3.1, and then you would immediately take up item 3.1 and solicit a second motion to add him uh, to the uh, to the panel. Would I solicit public comment then on the addition of the item to the agenda? Yes. All right. Is there any member of the community that would like to address us on, on this item? All right. Uh, seeing none, is there anybody online? I do see a speaker online. I'm not sure if they're for this or for normal public comment. Rachel, your microphone is now available. <laughs> it not for this, for another matter. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we'll close public comment. Um, if we get a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. And friend. All right, and so now we have item 3.1 out of the agenda. Is there a motion for item 3.1? So moved. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Koenig, a second from Supervisor Cummings. Uh, is there anybody from the community that'd like to address us on the exact same item? That is to permit uh, McPherson to uh, be by law. I just want to remind people that Bruce McPherson received tens of thousands of dollars from a triple Chinese communist spy. That's all. All right. Is there anybody else on this item? Anybody online? All right. So we'll close that. We'll have a motion, please. Or excuse me, a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. And friend? Aye. And that passes unanimously. And Supervisor McPherson will have you join us remotely. Welcome, Supervisor McPherson. You can hear us. Thank you. Yes. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Thank you. All right. So are there any items that any board members would like to remove from the consent to the regular agenda? <laughs> yes. Item uh, 87. Do you want to ask those questions during consent? Uh, no, I'll have it off the agenda. 
All Sorry, right. we didn't. We weren't able to hear. Uh, I right. move the microphone up. Uh, item 80, 87. I just had some questions about this item regarding the ultimate trail versus the interim trail. All right. So we are pulling item 87, and it'll become item. One sec. I get to the regular agenda. It'll become item uh, 14.1. Any other items? All right, seeing none, we'll now open up the opportunity for public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are either not on today's agenda, but within the purview of the Board of Supervisors or within the consent agenda, the regular agenda if you're unable to stay or the closed session item if you're unable to stay for that. Good morning, welcome. Uh, Chairman, Supervisors, a national magazine uh, issued June this year. Uh, talks about Red China having a police illegal police station in Manhattan, and they've had hundreds around the world. Um, uh, China has been uh, uh, stealing our technology. They've been buying food supplies and farms. They've been buying our ports and shipping terminals. Uh, and if there's going to be a fight for Taiwan, it will be fought on American soil. Uh, they have won contracts for rebuilding local infrastructure. Diane Feinstein's so-called Abby driver was a lie by the media uh, that continues to lie. Uh, he has been with her since she ran for supervisor, and he has spoken at UCSD right here at, in our home. Um, China has, uh, uh, well, they have, have this uh, illegal police station in downtown Manhattan. As it is in New York, so it is in Santa Cruz. We have two members of the Board of Supervisors uh, that worked for uh, Red China. Uh, one happens to be the chairman uh, presently. Uh, one of those uh, people he had worked for, his stepson is in league and a partner with Hunter Biden's millions of dollars that he's received uh, from Red China. Um, the two members uh, with the uh, Red Chinese having uh, backgrounds uh, have threatened institutions in this county to prevent speakers from speaking at the Grange. They threaten their persons and properties, and both the district attorney and the sheriff would not investigate. There are th hundreds of people that were attending those meetings that they would have easy access to. There is no prosecution here against illegality, just as there is no prosecution against Ill illegality uh, back east. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Abby. Yes, hello, good morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman. It's June 13th, 2023. I'm addressing the Santa Cruz Board of Supervisors. You know, a public service announcement, one of my favorite researchers, Mr. David Debine, does some very interesting programs that are easier to find on Rumble, the ADAPT 2030 and many Ice Age conversations. You know, he. I'm going to give him credit for this joke, you know. How do you launder $100 billion dollars you know, in twenty dollar bills, it's thirty three pounds per million. That's thirty. That's three point three million pounds, over fifteen hundred tons. Well, you crane it. So you know, there's going to be some interesting celebrations going on today with other organizations that have laundered over eighty two billion dollars through Silicon Valley Bank. You know, um, I'd like to see some changes. So I found out yesterday that a close friend of mine died on Sunday. You know, and I can say very directly that unelected chosen officials like Carlos Palacios, and then we have our elected, or supposedly elected, I mean, if we talk about the voter fraud from the Diebold machines that were brought in in 2002 by Mr. Bruce McPherson, but also, Mr. Manu Koenig and Zach Friend, you guys have been promoting these um, alternatives to health, which are these injections. So my friend succumbed to issues that came up after her second booster. And it's really quite sad. You know, there's a lot of things that people can do. And yeah, you guys should be looking down. It's a disgrace. You know, I've witnessed over a dozen people at an organization that are gone now because of these injections. So there's a lot of stuff going on. What is there? Over 2,500 pages today and crap. You guys are 
I don't even know what to say. I'd like to see some change. Thanks. Good morning and welcome. Thank you all. Uh, my name is Jim Garner. I live on Water Street. And uh, I wanted to make a comment about Rodeo Gulch Road at the 1700 block has fallen away in three places. And it's dangerous for uh, automobile uh, traffic. It's got three places that new, or new, has got worse recently. And there's some potholes that need replaced on Rodeo Gulch Road, I would believe. Now, the second item I had was that the, the, the property next to Santa Clara County Park as someone is doing uh, demolition work, and uh, they've, so I complained uh, to the governor on a phone call that I would like a park annex out of the property. I would request it. And we don't know who they are, but they left their demolition equipment and went away. That's a Jennifer County Park on um, Jennifer Avenue. So those are the two items that I had to make a comment on. That Rodeo Gulch Road could use some examination. Okay. Thank Next, you, sir. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back. Hello, Chair and members of the board. I'm Sierra Ryan. I'm the Water Resources Program Manager in Environmental Health. I'm here today to honor one of our staff members, Kristen Kittleson, who, as you saw in your packet, is going to be retiring uh, very soon. And myself and some of my colleagues from the Water Resources team wanted to take a moment to recognize her service to the county. Um, she's been with the county for over 24 years, and that doesn't include some time she spent um, starting in 1989, working in the planning department. Um, so we wanted to take an opportunity to read her proclamation today and just recognize her her service and the loss that we're all feeling uh, with her re retirement, although we're all very happy for her. Um, so with that. Good morning, Erin McCarthy. <clears throat> Proclamation honoring Kristen Kittleson on her retirement from the County of Santa Cruz. Whereas Kristen Kittleson will retire on August 2nd, 2023, having served as the fisheries resource planner for the County of Santa Cruz Health Services Agency for 24 years. And whereas Kristen Kittleson has been involved in the development of federal recovery plans for steelhead and coho salmon, including mapping the location of populations throughout the county, and whereas she has co-authored the 2004 San Lorenzo River Steelhead Enhancement Plan and participated in numerous watershed, fisheries, lagoon, and riparian studies. Thank you. Uh, Sean Abbey, Water Quality Specialist. Um, whereas Kristen coordinated a multi-agency juvenile steelhead monitoring program for 13 years, developed a database that now includes more than 20 years of data and helped design a website that won an international award. And whereas Kristen coordinated a fish passage program with the Department of Public Works, evaluating all county culvert stream crossings for fish passages that resulted in 14 passage projects. And whereas in collaboration with NOAA Fisheries, Kristen developed large woody material management program in 2009, a unique program that retained large wooden streams for steelhead and coho salmon habitat. And over 14 years, Kristen worked with more than 300 private property owners through this program and received a United Way Community Hero Award for her work in 2015. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Nathan Salazar, Environmental Health Specialist. Whereas Kristen has served with integrity, compassion, and poise while navigating different and sometimes conflicting priorities, working closely with staff, community members, and other agencies to find workable solutions. And whereas Kristen is a considerate, motivated, and dedicated colleague who champions the best interests of the community and protects our most valuable resources, equally at ease, waist deep in a stream and in front of an auditorium filled with people. Now, therefore, this is the population I. Zach Friend, Chair of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors, hereby recognize and thank Kristen Kittleson for her decades of exceptional service to the residents of Santa Cruz County and honor her significant contributions to the field of fisheries protection. It's been my privilege to work with Kristen for almost 10 years, and uh, she truly exemplifies the best of what it means to be a, a county public servant, working with the community, her personability, her, her tireless dedication, and she'll be greatly missed. Well, Kristen Kittleson, 
Uh, thank you for taking a few minutes to hear about these accomplishments. It's been a tremendous experience serving for 24 years as the County of Santa Cruz Fishery Resource Planner. There is a long history of county staff working on fisheries and watershed management, and I'm really proud to be part of this lineage. I want to extend a big thanks to all my coworkers and colleagues who I've worked with over the years and to community members who took the time to share information with me and to learn more about steelhead, coho salmon, streamwood, and other natural resource issues. Thank you, Board of Supervisors, for your continued support for Santa Cruz County Fisheries and Watershed Conservation. Thanks. Thank you, Kristen. Morning, welcome. Good morning, Chair Friend and Supervisors. Uh, congratulations to Kristen, of course. Um, we have another big loss today, another proclamation on the uh, agenda today. Uh, we're having to say goodbye to Carolyn Burke. Uh, she has been with the county for 21 years. She's done some outstanding work with outstanding contributions and, and commitment through all those years. She actually spent many years in public works and then many more years in planning, and now she's in community development infrastructure. So she's seen a lot of change over the years. Um, she's been a champion. Uh, she's been a role model. Uh, all of her colleagues look up to her. She served the public very, very well over these years. Uh, we're gonna miss her greatly. She, um, we're proud of the significant accomplishments um, and we're grateful for her contributions and uh, we will miss her. Best of luck to Carolyn and, uh, and congratulations to her. And I think uh, she's here, thank you. Thank you, everyone, and uh, thank you for the wonderful proclamation that's on your consent agenda today. I just want to extend my gratitude to the county family. Um, I started here 21 years ago when I was just 23 years old um, in the public works department at that time, uh, working for Tom Bolich. And so I've seen many directors and uh, and I've had the ability to learn from them as well as all of my colleagues um, who I have to say are of just the highest caliber. And I'm really um, continually impressed by the talent that we were able to attract here. And um, you know, recently uh, we were able to see the joining of public works and planning into community development and infrastructure. And I thank Matt Machado for his leadership during this time and for his enthusiasm and support of me and my role as assistant as CDI director. Um, I am looking forward to um, what the future has to hold in a city government as I, as I move on, but I just want to extend my deep gratitude to everyone here for their uh, encouragement, support over these years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carolyn. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. My name is Becky Steinbrenner. In following with these things, I would like to also commend Mr. Chris Berry for his 19 years of service on the Santa Cruz County Water Advisory Commission. His proclamation was presented to him at last week's commission meeting. He's an amazing resource, and um, I hope he doesn't stray far <laughs> from that commission because he always brings such a breadth of knowledge and history. I want to speak about some things on the consent agenda today. Um, item number 73, wherein the county will assume maintenance of the Parade Street SoCal Drive intersection, the private uh, rail crossing improvements, that were put in by the uh, Swenson Builders and Aptos Venture developers. Although it's $20,000 a year, I have real concerns 
about uh, the county accepting this agreement and the payment because of um, any liabilities that may also come along with that. I'm very worried about this new intersection. It is uh, very difficult to maneuver now, even with Parade Street closed and when that traffic opens and phase two construction begins and uh, opens up as it looks like it will be soon. I'm very worried about this intersection and I advise your board not to accept this, not to accept the money and um, advise that the HOA hire their own private maintenance contractor, not the county for liability reasons. Item 32, um, I commend you Chairman Friend for bringing a requirement for guidelines for county staff using AI. I'm very, um, very aware of this and uh, worried about how it can open up all of the databases and make it vulnerable to outside influences, um, especially with the digital wallet project that you are also forcing through. So thank you for this leadership and I look forward to the guidelines coming soon. Thank, thank you. you. Is there anybody else in chambers I'd like to address us? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, is there anybody online? Yes, Chair. Rachel, your microphone's now available. Hi, thank you so much for your service. Um, I would like to uh, raise some concerns I have about the digital wallet. I, I'd like to begin by referencing a, a very interesting article I read in the Government Finance Officers Association magazine website. They, I'm sure you're familiar with them. They recently gave an award to the city of Santa Cruz for their budget. This interesting article is entitled Cryptocurrency, Fairy Tale or Future. And it strongly encourages financial officers to not rush to be the first to adopt blockchain technology and Web3. Uh, they raise a variety of concerns, one of which is a fiduciary. I'm not a, a lawyer or finance expert, but but I think this is something that should be taken into account. The, uh, the blockchain organization company Humble, which is providing the pilot project is as of today worth 0 0.003 cents. I know that my financial advisor would not allow me to invest in such a company. And, I, and I'm very, very concerned that the County of Santa Cruz has any relationship at all were related to government services with this company. This company's overall project is to provide uh, you know, many different services internationally. On their recent um, uh, financial report, which is available, the discussion from the CEO on, on um, YouTube, they say that if Santa Cruz goes through, they are ready to scale this for cities and counties all over the, the nation and the world. And so there's a lot of responsibility in this pilot digital program. There's a lack of transparency about what programs are already signed up and how it's approved. There is essentially fraud in, in the sense that people are not being informed about Humble's relationship to the services they're signing up for presently. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody else online? Call in user 9902. Your microphone's now available. Yes, uh, this is Nina Beattie. I wanted to bring something to the attention of the board. On Sunday, Japan began dumping um, the Fukushima radioactive wastewater it's been storing into the Pacific Ocean. This water will travel to the Central Coast and Monterey Bay via the Kuroshio current, current um, and impact fisheries, the marine environment, and tourism. Korea, China, Japanese, and South Pacific Island residents, experts, and officials have been protesting and testifying against this plan for the several years, but there's been no public uh, publicized response from uh, local and state officials here in California against this plan. Uh, it, since it's already started, um, there needs to be urgent action uh, to stop this and not impact the ocean environment any more than uh, Fukushima already has. So I urge you, the Board of Supervisors, to contact state and federal officials um, to oppose this plan and also to yourselves write to the Japanese um, embassy and oppose this plan um, and stop this dumping that's going to have horrible impacts here in Monterey and in the Monterey Bay area. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else online? Call in user one, your microphone is now available.
Marilyn Garrett, please do take the advice of Nina Beatty. That's extremely important. Uh, as the county installs more and more microwave radiation emitting uh, sites, uh, this is military technology. It's deadly. I want to uh, share an article and what you're promoting calls for use of the cell phone for everything. So this is an article called The 100 Consequences of Owning a Cell Phone. This is from cellphonetaskforce.org of April 12th of this year. I'll read the list till you cut me off. And it's a partial list, I'm sure. Destruction of brain cells, stroke, seizures, tremors, multiple sclerosis, memory loss, heart attack, heart disease, cardiac arrhythmia, heart palpitations, high blood pressure, chest pain, brain cancer, breast cancer, disappearance of birds, Death of bats, birds, insects, worms, frogs, wildlife, uh, extermination of the lowland gorilla, child slavery in the Democratic Republic of Congo, conclude, continuing with this list of consequences of owning a, a cell phone, massive pollution of groundwater in China, genocide in West Papua, Anxiety, depression, ADHD, autism, paranoia, skin rash, depression, in Thank children. you, Ms. Garrett. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right. We will close public comment. We'll bring it back to the board to discuss consent. I'll actually begin with Supervisor McPherson remotely. Supervisor McPherson, are there any items on consent, any comments you would like to make on consent? Yeah. Yes, if I could. Can you hear me all right? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay, good. Thank you. First of all, I just want to say uh, we were going to miss uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Kittleson and Carolyn Burke immensely, 45 years combined. They are both gems in what they do, and they much appreciate it, as well as Mr. Barry, who was mentioned also. Um, I'd like to uh, talk about a couple items on consent agenda number 45, the electrical vehicle charging grant. Um, thank you for RR3 uh, for the work on this item. It's critical. We we add uh, more stations throughout the county and help address our climate goals, but as we remain com competitive with other communities. Uh, I want to thank them, the staff for the stations in San Lorenzo Valley, which is in particular need of this kind of infrastructure. Um, and as the, the sites continue to be identified, I'd also ask that we look at more sites in Boulder Creek, especially as Big Basin State Park comes back and more commuting resumes uh, up in the deep in the valley, in the northern end of the valley. And I'd also like, like to see more centralized locations in the valley, perhaps a few in Ben Lomond if possible. But we're moving forward and we're moving onward. Uh, and I'm very pleased with what we, uh, we are doing in this regard with the electrical vehicle charging stations. Um, number 65, um, the Housing Matters Project. Um, I want to congratulate and um, thank our Housing for Health office and our partners at Housing Matters on moving these projects forward in my district. It's Harvey West area, 120 units, but really uh, on behalf of the entire county, which is in dire need of uh, more housing. Um, we have long said that permanent supportive housing units are really a critical tool for helping and stabilize people experiencing homelessness. Uh, there's a lot of work that has gone into planning these projects over the course of many years now. And I'm glad we're able to secure the $8 million grant that we received. Um, a combination of items for 74 and 85, uh, thank the Public Works Department and CDI for managing these efforts to improve and maintain our roads. Uh, the status of our roads is probably what we hear more about in our office uh, from constituents than any other subject. There's, there's a lot to do and still not enough resources to do all that we would like to do. It's a, an enormous task to manage the countywide and road maintenance schedule. 
Um, in addition to all the emergency repair work dating back to the 2017 storms, including the storms of the past winter, um, I just uh, our need for more federal funding uh, in this regard is is uh, more more uh, necessary than ever. And uh, I just hope that we can get as many roads repaired as we can. Uh, but I, our departments are doing everything they can with the funding resources they have. So thank you very much. Uh, that's all I have to say in the comments on the consent agenda. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Uh, before I hand it off to my colleagues, I just want to note that I do need to recuse from item uh, 73 and 87, which is now 14.1. Both are rail line related items and I live within 500 feet of the rail line. So I have a personal potential personal financial conflict with those items. So I'll be recusing on 73 and then eventually 14.1 when it comes back to the board. Uh, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair Friend. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, thanking Karen Kroslowitz on item 30 for volunteering as a new first district arts commissioner. Uh, and on item 31, Charlotte Condalval for volunteering for the Library Advisory Commission. Our commissions are a vital part of county government and I uh, would thank both of these individuals for stepping forward to serve. On item 32, uh, I wanna thank you, Chair Friend, for bringing forward the AI guidelines. Um, as has been pointed out, the county definitely deals with a lot of words, a 2,500 page agenda today. And I think that AI does offer um, opportunities and promise to help everyone in the county do their job more efficiently. But of course, we do need to provide guide rails as we uh, explore those opportunities. And I think some of those set out here, including ensuring that um, we avoid any bias in um, the, the product produced by AI and, and also ensure that we're not sharing sensitive personal information or county secrets are essential. So again, thank you for your being proactive on this. On item 36, requesting that the California Department of Fish and Wildlife transfer ownership of Greyhound Rock to the county. I want to thank uh, Supervisor Cummings and the Parks Department for this proposal uh, to ultimately um, better manage Greyhound Rock, which is um, a, a park, I mean, technically fish and wildlife land, but at the northernmost part of our county, which uh, definitely consumes a lot of resources, county resources to efficiently manage. And I think that the proposal here um, would ultimately allow us to invest more in that facility uh, and also to improve the, the kinds of activities that can happen there and including some potential overnights for uh, for low income and another um, underserved community. So that would be really a great opportunity. And I hope that the State Fish and Wildlife Department agrees with us. Um, Finally, on item um, 72, Redwood Road Repair, I just want to recuse myself from that since I do have family that live on that road. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Supervisor Cummings. Oh. I'm so sorry, Chair. If you could just please repeat that number, Supervisor that was, Koenig. Uh, item 72. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, members of the public who came to comment. And I also want to express my appreciation for Ms. Kittles and Ms. Burke's um, work with the county. Uh, we will be missing you both very much. And um, even in the little amount of time that I've been able to work with, in particular, Ms. Burke, it's been really great to see how supportive you are, of making sure that we're addressing the needs of our community. So um, good luck on the next journey. And uh, we will be missing you here in the county. <laughs> um, I also want to congratulate on item number 23, our new Ag Commissioner, Dave Sanford, who will be joining um, us as our new Ag Commissioner. And um, I've been hearing some comments in the community about um, pesticide use and their concerns around that. And so I just look forward to having more conversations with you to see how we can help uh, better address some of the concerns that are coming out through the community, but just want to congratulate you on your new position. Um, Item number 26, uh, the county flag policy. I'm very supportive of this and, and thank um, the CAO for bringing this forward. Uh, the one thing that I did want to see if the, if the board will be willing to entertain is just an addition um, to the policy. And I'll just read, um, this is under general flag policy, item number two, D, flags may be lowered to half staff in accordance with the presidential proclamation or a proclamation by the California governor. And I wanted to add at the request by a county supervisor, and then it continues to read, or at the discretion of the county administrative officer to commemorate the deaths of county staff or those who have made significant contributions to the county's cultural or political history. Um, I know that at in most of the cities, the mayors oftentimes have the discretion, and given that we're the representatives of our, def, our individual districts, we're just seeing if that might be entertained by the board members as well. So I'd like to add that direction. Um, 
Let me get back to my notes. Uh, with regards to the AI policy, I also agree. I think this is something that's really important. Um, one of the things that I did not see, and maybe, I don't know if there's staff here who can comment on this, and or maybe the chair, but um, wanting to have a return date added to the direction, because right now it's kind of just open-ended, which means who knows when it'll come back. And um, if this is a priority for the chair to have us work on this, I'm just wondering if we can have a return date or a date when we can get an update on the progress on that policy. Yeah, I'd specifically... I Thanks for noticing that. I'd specifically um, left it open because they're already now starting to work on it, recognizing that the item was coming forward, but I didn't know what was a reasonable amount of time. So they, uh, the CAO had agreed to uh, bring something forward when when it was done. If you would, um, what do you think would be a reasonable amount of time? We can just have something brought back on consent or something just to give an update. Yeah, I think if you gave us, um, let's say four months, three or four months. Three months. Take three months. Sure. Right. Three was, months, that's yeah. fine. Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Parks Item Number 36 for bringing the Greyhound Rock issue to our attention. We've been working in collaboration with uh, the Parks Director, and we've also uh, let um, our State Senator John Laird know who's been working with us as well. And so we hope to um, hopefully have some meetings with Fish and Wildlife, and um, we'll be um, eager to bring back an update on how that progress is being made. Um, I remember 63, um, the housing assistants just want to thank the staff on their hard work on bringing forward additional tenant protection assistance and um, you know, really helping to keep people in their homes is critical to also helping us address our homelessness problem and also retain people within our community. And that also goes for the item number 70, housing authority of tenant assistance as well. Um, so just wanted to express my appreciation for um, staff being able to secure that funding. Um, and then uh, since the, the item 91 uh, recycling centers and gray bears item is on, I just wanted to take it as an opportunity to um, make a comment, which was that last week, um, the integrated waste management task force, a number of us were able to go take tours of the various facilities. And um, one thing that we came to find out that um, even some of the folks who work in waste management weren't aware of was that gray bears actually has a styrofoam recycling machine um, that they are uh, no longer going to be operating um, in the near future. And so um, as an integrated waste, as the chair of the integrated waste management task force, um, one of the items we're going to be thinking about and hopefully bringing forward is um, trying to figure out if we wanted to move forward with having a, um, a uh, styrofoam recycling machine where that could be located within the county because it appears that it's the only one within the region and they receive a lot of styrofoam products from UCSC and even from um, as far away as the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And so just making sure that we don't have styrofoam going into our landfill and we can actually repurpose it, I think is something that our community will be very supportive of in our efforts to try to address uh, environmental protection. So um, I'll end my comments there and um, thank you for the time. Thank you. In full agreement, actually, it was a the star from recycling was an item I brought for the board some years back, and that's how it ended up with the Gray Bears. Uh, but yeah, the expansion is an important discussion to have. Uh, Supervisor Hernandez. Uh, just briefly, I want to thank, of, of course, uh, Ms. Kittleson and Ms. and Ms. Burke for all their years of service, and congratulations to our ad commissioner, uh, Mr. Sanford. And thank you to Public Works and everyone that, and part of the, the waste management team that worked on the tour that we did of all our uh, sanitation sites. And we did visit the Gray Bears site in South County as well. So thank you for putting that together. And that's it. Thank you. I'll make some comments first uh, for Ms. Burke and Ms. Kittleson. Ms. They're both outstanding public servants. And Ms. Burke is going to be strange to think of this uh, broader planning world and changes without you here in a leadership position, a lot of the of the advancements that the county has made in the last few years in regards to planning and the customer centered approach has been because of you. Um, you really are a remarkable leader, and it's a great loss for the county, a remarkable gain for the community that you're going to. But I, but uh, just know that that you are very well respected within this institution, and you'll be missed. Um, on a few items here on the. Board. First, I'd also like to welcome Mr. Sanford, not really welcoming you because you've been doing this for a while, but it's, it's it's wonderful to see that you were selected on a national recruitment and also not surprising, you've done an outstanding job. You have a wonderful reputation throughout the broader community um, as somebody who uh, actually represents more agricultural land than any other county supervisor here on the board. I have to say that um, our office 
your office, I should say, uh, is not just respected in the region, but across the state and has done an outstanding job finding a way to build bridges with disparate interests. And so I'm looking forward to having, and you had a large role in that in your current position. And so elevating you to this role, I think is a natural fit and congratulations on that. Um, regarding the artificial the AI policy that my colleagues have already spoken about, uh, there's, it's unquestionably a transform transformational technology and there's significant possibilities associated with it. I think it's actually gonna be one of the largest uh, shifts that's occurred in local government um, since email and some of the advancement of other technological advancements, but it's happening at such a rate um, that it clearly needs some sense of a look internally to see how we put some guardrails uh, around it. But yet, it'll be a net benefit, I think, moving forward. I mean, I think that it could, it's already being used, for one, by, by local governments, uh, from everything from public works departments able to uh, look at real-time photos using AI to determine storm damage in a way that doesn't require them to physically be out there during storm damage, to creating RFPs in a way that significantly reduces time, um, to even... Uh, paralegals to looking at complex legal briefs in order to help analyze it. But there's issues with uh, the veracity of some of the information that comes in. There's information with some of the stuff that goes out associated with it. And so um, we're excited to also uh, be one of the first to try and look at this kind of policy and to work with our partners at the state through the California State Association of Counties, the National Association of Counties to help provide other counties with uh, a framework of what this kind of policy can look at, recognizing it's an iterative process. Um, any Every single time we make a change, it's already gonna be out of date on a policy like this. So this is really just giving more of a values-based framework on how to operate using this technology moving forward. I'm glad to see we're taking a lead on that. Uh, two last things, both in the parks world, um, it's excited to see the continued improvements in Willowbrook, including the new, uh, the new playground that'll be there, as well as the permanent restrooms at Hidden Beach Park, these are both long-term projects that um, I've partnered with the Parks Department on. They've been wonderful partners and leaders on this um, across the county, including with the new work that's being done in Supervisor Hernandez's district. We've made more investments in county parks in the last five years than we've made in probably about the 40 before that. And so it's a pretty significant upgrade and changes. And so I appreciate the work of the Parks Department, often unheralded for the work you do behind the scenes, Mr. Gaffney and your entire team. Appreciate that leadership. All right, so is there a motion with the additional direction for uh, understanding two recusals on two different items for the consent agenda? I'll move consent. Second. So we have a motion from Supervisor Cummings, a second from Supervisor Koenig. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. And that passes unanimously with two recusals on that item. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Madam Clerk? Uh, we'll move on to the regular agenda, the first item of the regular agenda, which is item seven. It was a long item, so bear with me as I read it, which is consider authorizing the auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector to proceed with necessary actions to secure the 2023-24 tax and revenue anticipation notes in an amount not to exceed $61 million and adopt a resolution mm -hmm. providing for the issuance and sale of the 23-24 tax and revenue anticipation notes in, in an amount not exceeding 61 million and approving the execution and delivery of a continuing disclosure certificate, approving an official notice inviting bids, a notice of intention to sell notes, an official statement, a continuing disclosure certificate, and certain other matters, certain other matters, <laughs> as outlined in the memo of the auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector, Ms. Driscoll. I know we have you here for this item. Good morning, Chair Friend and members of the board. Edith Driscoll, auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector. Also joining us this morning via telephone is Suzanne Harold, the county's municipal financial advisor for this financing issuance. The item before your board today is a request to authorize myself, the county auditor controller, to proceed with necessary actions to secure its annual tax and revenue anticipation note in an amount not to exceed $61 million. This note is being issued because counties have inconsistencies about when property taxes are received and when expenditures need to be paid. Taxes are the county's largest funding source and they are received primarily in December and April. Yet the county begins paying their budgeted expenditures as early as July 1. This note issuance, also referred to as a TRAN, is issued at the beginning of the fiscal year and paid off within 364 days with funds that are set aside from the two different large uh, property tax, uh, tax flows. 
This year's trend is higher than in recent years due to the uncertainty of when the county's outstanding FEMA reimbursements will actually be received. Regarding the method of sale for this year's TRAN, our municipal advisor is recommending that notes be sold on a competitive sale. However, the resolution presented for the board's consideration does allow for the county to switch to a negotiated sale if market conditions deteriorate before sale date. As in prior years, the county's fiscal team made presentations to Standard & Poor's and Moody's to obtain a rating for the note. The county's past short-term bond ratings from these agencies were at the highest rate, uh, highest level. The ratings are expected to be released today, so I can't give them to you yet. However, they have not indicated that there will be any change from that high level. In addition to the current year tax flow concerns, this TRAN also provides funding to cover a portion of the prior year tax delinquencies that the county has already dispersed to cities and agencies. Under the teeter plan, the county distributes the property tax revenues to the cities and agencies based on the total amount expected with no adjustment for unpaid or late tax payments. This provides those entities with consistent and guaranteed cash flow. And in exchange, the county receives the penalties on interest on any delinquent taxes once they are ultimately collected. In summary, I request that you approve the recommended actions necessary to secure the 23-24 tax and revenue anticipation notes in an amount not to exceed $61 million. That concludes my presentation. Both myself and Suzanne Harold, our municipal financial advisor, are available for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Driscoll. Thank you, Ms. Harold, also for being available remotely. Are there any questions from supervisors before we open this item up to the community? All right, seeing none, is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on this item, item seven? Nobody in chambers, is there anybody online? We have no speakers online, Chair. Okay, we'll close public comment and bring it back to the board for a motion. So move. move. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Cummings and a second from Supervisor Hernandez. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? All right, and that item passes unanimously. Thank you. Chair. I'm sorry. I, I, I've just been alerted that we didn't pick up the additional directions in the on the consent items. Um, and I, I would recommend for purposes of, of, of clarity that you reopen um, consent just simply to revise the motion that was adopted to pick up the additional direction because it currently is not um, indicated. Okay, is there a motion to reopen consent? So moved. <laughs> Thank you. All right. We have a motion from Supervisor Koenig and a second from Supervisor Hernandez. If we could have a roll call, this is just simply to reopen to change the motion. Supervisor Koenig. Oh, I'm sorry, the point and privilege. So do we need to restate the motion with the additional direction? Yes. I, okay. I, right now we're reopening consent, oh, oh, reconsideration of consent. So this is just simply a procedural motion to redo that. Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. Let's do some Groundhog Day. <laughs> so is there a motion then for consent with the understanding that there's two recusals, but articulating what the additional direction is? Um, Supervisor Cummings, you had the additional direction, I believe, on the items. So if you wouldn't mind actually uh, proposing the motion with the additional direction on the items. Sure. I'll move consent with the additional direction that for item number 26, county flag policy, that under... Um, Sorry, let me bring it up. Under general flag policy, item D, that the after by the gov by the California governor, comma, we add at the request by county supervisor to the language. And for item number 32, we add that an update come back to the board in three months. Is there a second? Second. All right. Um is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on consent with this additional direction? Please. This is, hi, my name is James. So this is number 33 has to do with the digital wallet? No. Okay, then I'm, I misheard. Okay. Uh, anybody online, Madam Clerk? We have no speakers on Okay, so we'll close public comment. We'll do a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Fred? 
Uh, that passes unanimously with recusals on two items and additional direction on those two items. Thank you, Council. We'll now move on to item eight on the regular agenda, which is as the Board of Directors of the Davenport County Sanitation District public hearing to consider the 2324 Davenport uh, County Sanitation District water and sewer service charge reports and adopt resolution confirming the water service charge reports for 2324 as outlined in the memo of the engineer. We have the memo, the summary of the district, the summary of the charge report and the resolution. And we have our CDI director, Mr. Matt Machado here. Mr. Machado. Thank you, Chair, Friend, and Supervisors, and good morning. Uh, Matt Machado, Director of CDI. Uh, the item before you is a public hearing on our 2324 Davenport County Sanitation District's sewer service charge reports. Uh, on May 9th of this year, I presented uh, the details of the rate increase, and the board approved in concept the 2324 service charges for the Davenport County Sanitation District and set, and set today as the date of the public hearing uh, for this service charge report. The recommended action uh, this morning is to open the public hearing, hear objections or protests, if any, to the proposed uh, sewer service charge reports, to close the public hearing and to adopt the resolution confirming the 2324 water and sewer service charge reports for the Davenport County Sanitation District. And I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Director Machado. Any questions from supervisors before we open the public hearing? As Seeing none, we'll now officially open up the public hearing. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on the Davenport, on item eight, which is the Davenport County Sanitation District water and sewer, sewer, uh, sewer service charge reports. Anybody from the chamber seeing none? Is there anybody online? We have no speakers online, Chair. Okay, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back for a motion. I'll move the recommended actions. I'll second. We have a motion from Supervisor Koenig, a second from Supervisor Cummings, and Supervisor Cummings. Yeah, I just want to thank uh, the staff for their hard work on this and all the outreach you've been able to conduct with folks in uh, the Davenport community. I know that they very much appreciate having um, an opportunity to speak with staff before the board was taking action. Um, I know at that meeting uh, that there was a lot of concerns around the rate increases, but I think that having the community be able to speak with you all and really understand why the rate increases were happening and also the, all the work that the staff was doing to secure grants to help offset the cost to really help folks um, understand the need for having to have these rate increases occur. So just want to express my my appreciation of that. And, um, and I think that's partly why we're able to move through this item so quickly today. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. We could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. And that passes unanimously. We'll move on to item nine, which is the Board of Directors of the Freedom County Sanitation District, a public hearing to consider the 2324 Freedom County Sanitation District Sewer Service Charge Report and adopt a resolution confirming the 2324 Sewer Service Charge Report as outlined in the memo of the district engineer. We have the board memo, the charge report, the summary report, and the resolution. Director Machado. Thank you, Chair, Friend, and Supervisors. Um, on May 9th, I, uh, I presented this item in detail, and the board approved in concept the service charges for the Freedom County Sanitation District, and they set you set today as the date for this public hearing for this charge report. Uh, the recommended actions are to open the public hearing and hear objections or protests, if any, and then to close the public hearing and adopt the resolution confirming the 2324 sewer service charge report for the Freedom County Sanitation District. And I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. Are there any questions for me, the county supervisors, before we open up the public hearing? I don't see any questions. And so we'll now officially open up the public hearing. Is there any member of the community that would like to address us on the Freedom County Sanitation District uh, sewer charge reports? I don't see anybody in chambers, Madam Clerk. Is there anybody online? No speakers online, Chair. Okay, we will close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for a motion. I'll move the recommended actions. I'll second. second. All right. Uh, we have a motion from Supervisor Koenig, and just because uh, we want to give Supervisor McPherson one, you know, we'll <laughs> give the second to <laughs> Supervisor McPherson. Uh, Could we have a roll call, please? Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And friend? Aye. And that item passes unanimously. We'll now move on to item 10, which is a public hearing to consider FY2324 benefit assessment and service charge reports for the Sanitation County Service Areas of 2, 5, 7, 10, and 20 and adopt a resolution confirming 
these service charge reports as outlined in the memo of the deputy CAO director of CDI. We have the board memo, the sanitation electric electronic charge reports, the summary reports, and the resolution. Director Machado. Thank you, Chair, Friend, and Supervisors. On March 14th, I presented the details of, of the proposed increase assessments and the board set today as the public hearing uh, for this item. The recommended actions are to open the public hearing, hear objections or protests uh, to the charge report and to close the public hearing and then to adopt the resolution confirming the benefit assessment service charge reports for these various CSA areas. And I can answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for that. Are there any questions? For my colleagues on this item? I don't see any, so we'll open up the public hearing on item 10. Are there any questions from the community on Sanitation County Service Areas 2, 5, 7, 10, or 20 during this public hearing? I see none in chambers. Madam Clerk, anybody online? No callers online. Okay, we will close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for a motion. Move the recommended actions. Second. A motion from Supervisor Koenig and a second from Supervisor Hernandez. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. And that passes unanimously. Item, thank, thank you. you, Director Machado. For item 11, this is a public hearing to consider a resolution confirming proposed FY2324 assessment service charge reports for County Service Area 12. Wastewater management is outlined in the memo of the Director of Health Services. We have a the agenda item, the notice of public hearing, and the resolution. And we have Director Morales and, and uh, Director Strider from uh, health uh, from human from health services as well as our environmental health division director. Uh, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, board. Uh just a reminder that today, May 9th, the board adopted the resolution confirming the establishment of benefit service charges for county service area. Oh, you can't hear me. Thank you so much, uh, 12, for fiscal year 23-24. Um, as such, today is Tuesday, uh, June 13th, as the date for the public hearing to take place. Um, with that, I just want to remind the board that we're here to answer any of your questions, and I'll you know, kick it now to Director um, Andrew Strader to answer any more questions and follow up with some details. Thank you. Good morning. Is this on? Sorry. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Chair Friend and members of the board. Um, yeah, just to reiterate, on May 9th, uh, 2023, the board adopted resolutions confirming the establishment of benefit assessments service charges for CSA 12 for fiscal year 23-24. Uh, the board also set to Tuesday, June 13th, 2023, as a date for a public hearing on the proposed 23-24 benefit assessment service charge reports. Uh, CSA 12 assessment service charges are expected to generate approximately $1,280,000 in the fiscal year 23-24. Uh, it is important to note though, that those proposed rates remain unchanged from the prior fiscal year 22-23. Uh, fees collected under CSA 12 uh, provide for the general administration of the uh, OTS maintenance and pollution reduction program that includes better tracking, uh, inform of information on system maintenance, permits, pumping, and inspections, uh, water quality monitoring of streams impacted by septic systems, investigation of complaints and enforcement related to failing systems, and property owner education on better system ma management. With the adoption of the local area management program, LAMP, under the state's policy for on-site wastewater treatment systems, activities associated with CSA 12 are an integral, integral part of the compliance with the state's requirements. To complete the fiscal year 2324 benefit assessment service charge proceedings, it is necessary for the board to open the public hearing, take testimony and consider objections and protests to the reports, close the public hearing and consider adoption of the resolution confirming the benefit assessment service charge reports. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from my colleagues on this item? I uh, see none. We will now open up the public hearing on item 11 regarding the service charge reports for County Service Area 12. Good morning. Welcome back. Good morning. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I am a resident of rural Santa Cruz Mountains. And um, at last week's Santa Cruz County Water Advisory Commission meeting, there was considerable talk about the impacts of uh, 
failing septic systems on the water quality in the center in this in the watersheds and it was really um clear that our county needs to offer some easily accessible financial incentives for people who have failing systems or problematic systems to do upgrades necessary to protect our water quality. I would like to see some of this money set aside in a fund for um, people who have problems with, with systems to at least get some technical advisory, um, free technical advisory uh, and geotech work done so that they can maintain their systems in a healthy way for the water quality of the area. I also want to point out that due to the county's um, approval of the new septic system ordinance, a considerable number of people will be forced to um, add the advanced treatment systems to their property. My question is, I am aware that there is a fee that those people have to pay for annual inspections. Is that part of CSA 12? In paying CSA 12 fees, is that um, balanced with the additional fees that any property owner with an advanced treatment system has to pay for annual inspections by the county? It should be. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on CSA 12? I don't see anybody in chambers. Is there anybody online? Yes, Chair, we do have a speaker. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. Carolyn Garrett, <clears throat> it seems like there are so many assessment, increased tax charges for everything. I would like to hear a response to Becky Steinbrenner's question that she just put to you, because it seems like the huge requirements on people who have septic systems um, really are financially very burdensome or impossible to fulfill, which um, really impacts, um, you know, sales or people living in these areas that have septic systems. So I'm listening for a response to the question Becky Steinbrunner put to you. It is very disturbing how the board disregards members of the public who give you excellent direction and comments, and then you act like we're not here. So I'm listening for a response right now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Is there anybody else online? No further speakers, Chair. Okay, we'll close the public hearing, but before bringing it back to the board, are there any additional comments uh, that would like to be made by uh, either of our two directors in regards to the questions? Yeah, I, I just to provide a little bit of clarification. So uh, CSL A12 has two subsets, CSA 12A and CSA 12N. CSA 12N uh, is the assessment for the enhanced surface water treatment uh, systems uh, that was referred to. Uh, uh, and that is a separate uh, assessment uh, under CSA 12N than the the normal CSA 12 assessment. Okay, thank you. All right, so is there, bringing it back to the board, is there, are there any additional questions or is there a motion? I'll move the recommended actions. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Koenig and a second from Supervisor Hernandez. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Friend. Aye, and that item passes unanimously. Thank you both for your presentation and for the community's questions on that item. We'll now move to item 12, which is to consider adoption of resolutions confirming the previously established benefit assessment rates for county service areas for Opera Dunes and CSA 48 County Fire to adopt resolutions setting a public hearing June 27th, 2023 on the proposed 23-24 service charge reports for CSAs 4 and 48 and take related actions as outlined 
a memo of the Director of General Services. We have the board uh, memo. We have the CSA 4 resolutions and the CSA 48 resolutions, as well as the notice of public hearings for both. Uh, welcome, Director Beaton. Uh, thank you, board uh, chair. Uh, Michael Beaton, Director of General Services. Uh, just as you identified, the agenda item before you is to uh, adopt the resolutions confirming the previously established benefit assessment rates for County Fire and Pajaro Dunes Fire County Service Area Districts 48 and 4, and to adopt the attached resolution setting June 27, 2023 uh, as the public hearing date for those uh, proposed service charge increases. Uh, with that, I'm available for any questions the board may have. Are there any questions in regards to um, these resolutions for CSAs 4 or 48? Please. So just to be clear, uh, for CSA 48, we can increase it with inflation, but no more than 4%. So in years like we've had where inflation is, of course, above 4%, we're falling behind, right? Yeah, so in CSA 48, there's actually two uh, special benefit assessments. Uh, one is the legacy assessment, which does go all the way up to the CPI. Uh, then we have the CSA uh, 2020 uh, special benefit assessment that the voters approved. Uh, in that uh, special benefit assessment, it does have a cap of 4% uh, per annual uh, increase, uh, which would put us behind the um, continuing uh, index increasing and in costs. Okay. It just seems to me that in the future, we should tie it to full CPI so we don't get, end up in this situation. We have other CSAs in the county where uh, they're not tied to CPI at all, and it does create problems and ultimately just additional work, um, and that we have to you know, go through the additional paperwork or pass an additional measure to then uh, correct these in the future. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Any additional questions from anybody? Uh, seeing none, we'll open it up for the community in regards to CSAs 4 and 48. Would anybody in the community like to address us on these resolutions? Good morning. Welcome back. Good morning, Nikki Steinbrenner. I'm here as a uh, resident of CSA 48 to protest this increase. You have no budget from County Fire. You have no contract with Cal Fire for the coming year. So what is the justification for increasing it simply because you can without any financial justification for need? As a taxpayer, I protest this. And I also want to point out that I have gone to, um, with, with regard to CSA 482020, the special benefits assessment, no public agency or utility is exempt from that charge. And yet, State Parks pays nothing in CSA 48 2020 fees. I went to the assessor's office and asked and verified it at the tax collector. Nicene Marks, thousands of acres, pays nothing. Now, I suspect that this could be because of the legal challenge that um, has stated that it is against the law, government code 50078.2b, to use benefic special benefit assessments for fire suppression in the SRA area in watersheds and timberland areas. But I, wanted, I want an explanation why state parks is paying zero in CSA 48 2020 assessments. I also think that, um, we need to have, uh, it needs to be clear, and it is not in the staff report, that CSA 48, every structure is to assess two fire flow units. So it's not just one, it's double the amount that is in the staff report. And the CPI increases become a cumulative increase in the tax over time, much more than many people can pay, and it is unjustified. We have no... Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Thank this you. Need... And it's a reminder that the item actually before us today are, are resolutions that are confirming the previously established amounts and simply setting a public hearing for the, the upcoming amounts. Uh, we're not actually voting on the upcoming amounts right now. Um, is there anybody else from the chambers that would like to address us on this item? Madam Clerk, anybody online? Yes, Chair, we do have speakers online. 
Charlie, your microphone's now available. Hi, uh, Charlie Edie. ED Consultants, uh, representing the management committees at uh, Pajaro Dunes. I just wanted to give you uh, an FYI that Pajaro Dunes is working with uh, Michael Beaton and Cal Fire in the budget to include money to do an engineer's report that would uh, allow consideration of an increase in the benefit uh, in the assessment in order to provide a higher level of uh, fire service in the future. This is independent from what's going on with LASCO and the, and the comprehensive study. This is just part of Dunes themselves. And um, we don't know where it's going to end up, but the, the desire of the uh, part of Dunes folks is to really look seriously at taxing themselves at a higher rate in order to improve the level of fire and medical response for them. So anyway, I'm just uh, here to report that. And uh, that's an FYI. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edie. Call in user one, your microphone's now available. Carolyn Guerra. I also object to this increase. What was uh, approved before and any future increases. And I sure wish Becky Steinbrunner were the supervisor for my area instead of the present one because she does her homework and um, speaks uh, the truth and in her analysis and acts on behalf of the public. I think it is very revealing that you as a board, when you, instead of any response to these um, very important criticisms of what's going on, you uh, do not respond. You just proceed. It's like your puppets uh, of someone, I feel, not in the sense of representative government, and um, it, it's very disturbing. We're told we live in a democracy and that people decide what is in their best interest through representatives, and um, you're not doing it. What's the matter here? This is not representative, and it's not proper, and it doesn't show integrity. That's my my comments. I urge a no vote on this. All right, is there anybody else online? No further speakers, Chair. Okay, we will close public comment and bring it back to the board. Is there a motion for the recommended actions? I'll move the recommended actions. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion from Supervisor Koenig and a second from Supervisor Cummings. If we could have a roll call. Please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Yes. McPherson? Aye. And friend? Aye. And that item passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Beaton. We'll now move on to item 13. Item 13 is a jurisdictional hearing to consider an appeal of application number 211316, an application to construct 110 linear feet of pin pier retaining wall on a property located at 266 Cliff Court in Aptos, APN 04308113. Is that line in the memo of the Deputy CAO and Director of Community Development and Infrastructure? We have the agenda item memo, the appeal letter, the staff report to the Planning Commission. There was an option for the audio for, uh, on the Planning Commission hearing as well, as well as comments that we received. Mr. Burke and Mr. Dittmar is here. Good morning and welcome to you both. Good morning, Chair Friend and members of the board. Evan Dittmar, Development Review Planner. This is a jurisdictional hearing to consider an appeal of the Planning Commission's April 26, 2023 action to uphold the zoning administrator's decision to deny application 211316, which was a proposal uh, to construct a pin peer retaining wall. Uh, at 266 Cliff Court in Aptos. Uh, at that hearing, the commission considered the item on appeal from the zoning administrator following two zoning administrator hearings 
held on November 18th and December 16th, 2022. The property is located in the Rio Del Mar area of Aptos, approximately 1,500 feet south of the Rio Del Mar Boulevard and Aptos Beach Drive intersections. 266 Cliff Court is developed with a single family dwelling, which is uh, approximately 33 feet from the edge of the bluff and 100 feet above the homes below on Beach Drive. The project proposes the construction of a pin cure retaining wall, which would be constructed near the south property line, uh, built approximately up 100 feet uphill from Beach Drive, and would be constructed with piers driven approximately 40 feet below grade. Uh, the picture on the right shows a section of the proposed wall, and the picture on the left is the view of the 100 feet of hillside, which sit below the subject property. As stated earlier, this item is a jurisdictional hearing to consider the appeal of the Planning Commission's April 2020, April 26, 23 uh, denial of application 211316, uh, which followed the zoning administrator's denial. Santa Cruz County Code Section 1810340 specifies that the Board of Supervisors will not take jurisdiction of an appeal unless the Board is convinced of one of five criteria, which are listed on this slide. We believe the appellant's letter is attachment one and page 213 of the agenda packet for today's hearing has not demonstrated the requisite criteria for your board to take jurisdiction. Among the issues raised in the letter, the appellant disputes the requirement for an alternatives analysis. The county geologic hazards ordinance adopted as part of the the county's local coastal program expressly requires that applications for shoreline protection structures shall include a thorough analysis of all reasonable alternatives to such structures, including but not limited to relocation or partial removal of the threatened structure, protection of only the upper bluff area or the area immediately adjacent to the threatened structure, beach nourishment, and vertical walls. Structural protection measures on the bluff and beach shall only be permitted where non-structural measures such as relocating the structure or changing the design are infeasible from an engineering standpoint or, or are not economically viable. The materials submitted to the zoning administrator and the record submitted for decision before the planning commission did not include this analysis. And items one, two, and four of the appellant's letter acknowledge the absence of this study and dispute its necessity. The appellant further contends that the commission erred in judgment by declining to grant additional continuance and in rendering a decision without counsel for the applicant or uh, with, with counsel for applicant and owner present. However, the appellant represented at the March 22, 23 hearing that the continuance would allow the alternatives analysis to be prepared and submitted for review by planning staff. The decision to continue the item to the April 26 agenda was discussed publicly in the presence of counsel for the applicant and remote participation in remote hearings uh, has been available. The appellant's attendance at the hearing is not required for the commission to render a decision. No evidence has been provided, which substantiates that any of the commissioner's actions or the planning commission as a whole, acting to uphold the zoning administrator's denial of the project was biased in its action. There is no new or significant evidence presented relevant to the decision. The decisions which were rendered by the zoning administrator and the planning commission were rendered appropriately, impartially, and in consideration of the facts presented at the previous four public hearings. Therefore, the following actions are recommended uh, for your board to conduct a jurisdictional hearing to consider whether to take jurisdiction of the appeal of Coastal Development Permit Application 211316, an application to construct 110 linear feet of pin pier retaining wall at the property located at 266 Cliff Court, and to decline jurisdiction of the appeal of Application 211316. And that concludes my presentation, and I am available for questions. 
Thank you, Mr. Dittmar. Are there questions from supervisors before we open this up to the community for their uh, comments? Please, Supervisor Cummings. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for that presentation. Um, I did have a question. On, based on what I heard about, about um, the Planning Commission meeting, it sounded like there was a continuance to try to allow the applicants to conduct this alternative analysis. And I'm just wondering, was the applicant actually moving forward with that? Um, and what's the current state of that? Because I, I guess from the way I'm thinking about how to take action on this is if, if the applicant in good faith is moving forward with an alternatives analysis, I mean, it seems like it would make sense for us to be able to hear what those alternatives are and if there's an opportunity for a way forward. The applicant did represent at the initial planning commission hearing that they would, that a continuance would facilitate the production of an alternatives analysis. Uh, when we returned following that continuance, there was still no alternatives analysis prepared to that point. Um, and yeah. thus our recommendation for denial uh, stood. Um, I also want to reiterate that it was an appeal of a decision rendered by the uh, zoning administrator, which was a denial um, because that alternatives analysis was not included as a submitted, submitted item um, when that decision was rendered. And so has there been any, has the applicant expressed in any way that they are working on that or is? We've not received um, any additional, aside from the appeal letter provided uh, as an attachment to this, we've not received the alternatives analysis. They did represent um, at the continued hearing that they need some additional time. They were working on it. Um, but to date, we, um, the planning department has not evaluated any alternatives analysis. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Supervisor Koenig, please. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about the county code, so 1610-040, uh, section 59, the definition of shoreline protection structure. Uh, it says shoreline protection structure means any structure or material, including but not limited to riprap or a seawall placed in an area where coastal processes operate. Um, that to me sounds pretty Big. I mean, it says riprap or seawall, but not limited to. I mean, so under this definition, could a mailbox placed in a place where coastal processes operate be considered a seawall or a coastal protection structure? Thank you. Carolyn Burke, Assistant Director, CDI. Uh, I, I think that's an interesting hypothetical that you put forward. I think this is pretty clear cut coastal processes. We do have a definition for coastal erosion processes, which includes both terrestrial and uh, and uh, sea-driven sea uh, land movement. Um, very recently, while we're not the Coastal Commission, there was a project that was um, on Joffroy Drive that was a reinforced earth um, staircase or, or a, uh, a hill slope failure uh, repair that the Coastal Commission did determine was a shoreline protection structure due to the location where it is and what's, what its intended purpose is, which is to prevent the further movement of uh, soil in that area. Okay, right. so what I hear you're saying is even, we, we have this definition, uh, you say of coastal erosion processes, that's 12. So even though the erosion might be happening from rainstorms which happen all over the county because it's specifically in the coastal area and deals with the coastal bluff it's still considered a shoreline protection structure yes this is an eroding coastal bluff and that erosion originates from both terrestrial and sea sea driven uh, mechanisms and i mean I, I might be going too far to ask you to opine on the reason for that i mean is, is it because the cliff nourishes the beach or is there any anywhere else in that it discusses why we've defined it that way? Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I do feel uh, that the origins of it, I, I think it is going too far to opine on the original intent. This was obviously written back in the 1970s and 80s. And um, it has been considered since, and we can talk about how we have implemented this, and this is consistent with our implementation and view of these types of projects over time. I think part of it is uh, beach nourishment in some of our more um, terraformed areas such as Beach Drive that obviously becomes a little bit more complex because there are 
um, humans at the base of those bluffs doing things with the sand and such. Uh, but yes, the original intent is to consider the uh, natural erosion patterns um, and how those impact coastal processes. Okay, thank you. And just as a point of clarification, because we're kind of broadening the discussion here, this is a jurisdictional hearing. It's pretty narrow what we can consider. So too was the Planning Commission a jurisdictional hearing on the actions of the ZA, correct? Um, although they allowed for a continuance, that's actually not a common practice to offer a continuance because there's just a jurisdictional hearing. So if if uh, I recollect correctly, they dismissed without prejudice. The applicant, should the board elect not to take jurisdiction today, still could reapply with the alternative analysis, correct? Uh, which would allow them to move, well, I don't know, move forward, but they would still allow to have that considered by the planning department. Is that a correct statement? Correct. It could be reconsidered. Okay. So as a reminder for the board, we, we have to show that in order to take jurisdiction or remand to the planning commission, we have to show that one of these five criteria have been made. Case has been made by uh, their legal counsel. They believe something has, but at the end of the day, uh, the planning commission did dismiss without prejudice. Uh, the applicant could reapply with the alternative analysis to the planning department for consideration of this project. Yes, and that would provide us an opportunity to not only review the analysis, but also make the findings for approval or denial based upon that analysis and any supplemental information okay. to determine conformance with our code. Okay. Are there, thank you very much for that. Are there any additional questions from uh, our other supervisors? I've seen none. We'll uh, help. Sorry, hard, Terry. Uh, so one, one other question about the process. Um, it seems to me there, uh, my understanding is that maybe there was some... Um, miscommunication about the requirements of the application because the application was accepted at the same time that we said that an alternatives analysis was required, right? So, I mean, in theory, should it only have been accepted if it was complete and it included the alternatives analysis at the time of application? And was that not an error? We did accept the application as complete, um, but when we say complete, it's complete for processing, meaning that we can render a decision. We did advise um, that the alternatives analysis was required and um, the lack of alternative analysis could be grounds for denial. Um, that was um, outlined in both the incomplete letter and the completeness letter. But the, com the complete letter allows us to bring the project forward. We've um, obtained the necessary. We've obtained enough information to make a recommendation on the project based on the materials provided. Okay, thanks. Okay, we would like to open it up for the community. Is there any member of the community that would like to address us on this jurisdictional hearing? <laughs> morning. Welcome. Thank you for waiting through the morning session. Morning, Supervisors. My name is Eric Zinn. I'm with Pacific Crest Engineering. I'm the project geologist of record for the Kozlowski project, the, the uh, 266 Cliff Court. A um, little bit of bookkeeping just to answer some of the questions I heard. Alternatives analysis was completed last week. It is in your packet, I believe. Um, and then regarding Supervisors Koenig's question, I actually have a pretty simple answer for that. Uh, the mailbox question. Does it need to be, is it a shoreline protection structure? So if you go to County Geologic Hazards Codes, uh, section 1610.070.h.3.f, it's, it's one of the criteria for what, for what you need to have in order to, for it to be a short, considered a shoreline protection structure. It has to be designed to standard of practice uh, for engineering. So, uh, a mailbox is not engineered or any wave forces whatsoever. Therefore, it's not a shoreline protection structure. Um, to hit, the, uh, I think our packet is pretty plenary, so it kind of speaks for itself. It's in in the uh, the agenda packet. I'll just hit the high points. Um, so we basically set out to keep the Kozlowski soil and water from striking the residences down below. That's a really important distinction to make. Um, County staff, county staff suggestion that the Kozlowskis mitigate the landslide hazard off of their property is neither practical nor legally supportable. That's from our council, Greg Sanders with Nossaman. Um, the Kozlowskis don't own the soil that's off their property and no cooperation has been procured from the property owners of the land that abuts the Kozlowskis property downslope. Uh, the pro and 
getting back to the mailbox question, in, in our situation, the project civil and geotechnical engineers have clearly stated and, and stamped and signed letters that the proposed pin pier wall is not engineered to be a shoreline protection structure. Therefore, the pin pier wall is not a shoreline protection structure since it does not satisfy the criteria outlined in, in County Geologic Hazards Code section 1610070H3F, as well as the Santa Cruz County General Plan section 6.2.16 paragraph five. So in any statement, to the contrary by county staff needs to be backed up by engineering calculations made by a licensed professional engineer that refutes the findings by the project engineers. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Britton, welcome back. Good morning, Co. Britton, Max Britton, architect. I uh, represent multiple coastal property owners, including homeowners below. I wanna note that this is a semi-judicial event. And I would request equal time to county staff in this presentation and to allow the geologist to finish his presentation. Uh, it's inappropriate to limit us to two minutes. So I'm gonna first start. This is a set of plans stamped and signed by the Coastal Commission within a 15 minute walk from this property where the Coastal Commission Acknowledge that once an engineer says a structure is not a shoreline protection structure under county code and under the county LCP and the Coastal Act, it is therefore not a shoreline protection structure. The county staff narrative is misleading, incomplete, and inaccurate. The fact is that we submit when we appealed the necessity for an alternatives analysis. They refused to take that appeal to the board. Legally, it should have gone to you. By accepting it as complete, that means the county is barred from requiring it. That's the Permit Streamlining Act. It's completely disingenuous to come here and say that it should be not denied because of the alternatives analysis. We also appealed the concept that this was a shoreline protection structure to the boss, to you. County staff refused to take it to you. We now have Mr. Machado under investigation of the licensing board over this issue. Rainy Graven from the county, uh, from the Coastal Commission, is under investigation under this issue. By rights, probably Mr. Dittmar should be also. This is not a shoreline protection structure because it is not engineered to be one. That's required by our code. This is simply 1,000 cubic yards of dirt that is being retained to, for the life safety of the people below them. It is only practical and only um, legally ability for our clients to do the people below are immensely grateful for them doing so. But we can't be put into the position that at the whim of county staff, they can say something is a shoreline protection structure when it's not engineered to be so. And it needs to be understand the coastal zone please, is please huge. Finish. Well, again, I request additional time. I represent multiple clients. And, and speaking to the jurisdiction hearing about one of the five criteria by which we should take jurisdiction, Mr. Well, that, that this is missing information. That it is missing information that the code says this. We requested the county staff address multiple times that, that it's required to have an engineering determination that was not presented to the ZA, that was not presented to the planning commissioner. The ZA actually had an error in the planning staff, the planning staff acknowledged afterwards that they misquoted the code. We have very specific documented right. missing things, but the staff isn't presenting it to you. Thank you, Mr. Britton. Thank you. Good morning, welcome, thank you for waiting. Good morning, uh, Kirk Kozlowski, good morning, supervisors. I am, um, my wife and Perry and I are the homeowners. And um, we're just trying to do what we can do with our property for, to protect the lives of the people below us. So um, we realize that these cases don't appear before you very often given the time and considerable expense. And 
heartache to get here. This is emotional for us. And to hear staff provide incomplete or misdirect the zoning administrator, misdirect the planning commission, misdirect you, it, it, it just kills us. It just kills us. Um, we're persisting for, with this project because in good conscience, we feel we have to. Um, we're compelled to do the right thing. When we first learned of this, we reached out to the county, called them out there. Jessica DeGrassi came out with the engineers. They took a look at the situation, recommended that we process this application to you all. And so we went back, we looked for our team, we found a team, and we dug in and we provided this. Um, and then Ms. Ms. Burke tells us that we were dead on arrival when we showed up. And I can't fathom this. Help, help us understand what's happening here. I, I just don't get it. Life safety is the biggest issue, and it's being completely ignored. It's beyond our comprehension. You know, this project is consistent with other projects up and down the coastline that have been approved. We're trying to help the people below us in good conscience here. And we can only do what we can do with our property. And I, this whole process has been so disingenuous. And now we're being said, you can come back and apply. Oh my gosh, I, I don't know what's going on here. These people, they're so manipulative. We're, we're, just, we're getting abused here, abused. I'll just Thank pick you. up where he left off. I'm Mary Lassert, also homeowner. Very emotional. My voice is shaky. This whole thing, I'm a grandmother. I have gotten calls, 911 calls from the people below us. When the soil below breaks loose and goes through their kitchen, and there's a sippy cup on the countertop, I'm shaking. This is a life safety issue. And if I hear quoting code one more time, it's going to put me under. I have used so much money and it's not about the money because if it was, I, I, I wouldn't be here. I would have given up a long time ago. We're hundreds of thousands of dollars. Every person that has supported this from an engineering standpoint, from a legal standpoint, from all of it, it has drained our coffers. So when I hear you say, hey, they're going to have an opportunity, just resupply, just reapply. Do you think we're going to be met with a, hey, come on in, sit down, let's work this out. We weren't met with that from the beginning. We were told, don't even apply. Degrassi said, get your team together, get your plan together, come be ready and be solid. And we thought that's what we did. But what we were met with is, you basically dead on arrival. And since then, it's been a clash. And I apologize. I, I know you guys are very educated. I understand that. But I felt like I entered a war. And it's not my war. I'm just trying to help the people below me. And this is very emotional. It's very expensive. And if it stops here, then it's going to stop here because I'm out of money. I'm out of emotion. And I'm really not sure what's going to happen with the very next rain. I'm a gardener. I'm watching my hill. It's ready to break loose. It's going to break loose. So I'm going to have them call you guys instead of calling me because right now they're all calling me or 911. So I'll just add your phone numbers. I'm sorry. Thank you. Is there anybody else like to address this during the jurisdictional hearing? Good morning. Morning. Um, I'm Richard Irish. I'm the civil engineer of record for the project. Um, and I just have a few comments. Um, I want to say to you all, this is not a shoreline protection structure. It has not been designed to be one. It can't be one due to the forces that would be applied to it if it were a shoreline protection structure. The location of it is over 350 feet from the ocean. And the loading that it was designed for as well is just for earth pressure. So just on the technical side, it can't be a shoreline protection structure. 
the design and the purpose of the project from the start was to prevent the slope from failing onto the houses below. And that's all it was designed for. And that's all it's ever been designed for. At the um, first Board of Appeals hearing, they asked for an alternatives analysis. Our team agreed to provide that. I wasn't at the second one, but we were working and it was understood that it would take longer than one meeting cycle to get to it. So we have provided that alternative analysis and that has always been the intent to do so. To, to hear someone say that we ignore them or weren't going to do it is not true. The team has provided that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address this on this item? Please feel free. Good morning. I'm Rocky Franich, and um, I want to go on record, first of all, complaining about the sound system in this building. And it's the same complaint I had when I came to the Planning Commission meeting about three months ago. Three months ago. I can't hear you people very well. I can hear the people from the audience, but I think it has to do with how people use the microphone, or maybe Carlos can turn the volume up a little bit or something. Anyway, I just want to go on record. I'm one of the neighbors below, and... It's been a disaster. I, I'm sure you've all been up and down Beach Drive, but I spent about $30,000 hauling mud out from behind my house at $300 a load to the dump. When I came to the meeting two or three months ago, I really had the feeling that the uh, Planning Commission was leaning forward on approving this. And I, I'm just shocked that it's make, being so drug out over this long period of time. It absolutely is not a shoreline issue. It's a mudslide issue. And it's a threat to the houses down below. There's about three or four houses. There's all kinds of houses on Beach Drive that have problems. Mr. Kozlowski, I think, is really trying to do the right thing. So I hope you guys will approve this. Let him get going on the project. We, we, he's got to get going pretty soon so that we don't have another problem next winter. There's an El Nino coming. It could be a wet winter. Let's get the job done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. French. Thank you for waiting. Good morning. Welcome back. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I have pressed these kinds of jurisdictional uh, request appeals. And as a point of order, the appellant gets equal time to the county's presentation. This has not been handled properly. So I want to make that point. I also feel that if you all took an oath to uphold the Constitution. Article 13, Section 35 says, protecting the public health and safety is your number one job. Now listen to these people. They're trying to do the right thing to protect the life and safety of those below them. And the county is standing in the way. The county is putting them through hell and a lot of expense. What is this about? This is not a shoreline protection project. This is a neighbor trying to do their best to protect the lives and property of those below them. And the county is standing in the way. If the county stands in the way, does that make the county liable for any future damages that happened to the pro to the homes and the families and the lives below? I think it does. Now you need to think of that. And you need to think about your oath that you will uphold the constitution to keep public safety, the lives and health of your constituents as primary. Don't put these people through anything more and just let them do what they're trying to do to to save the lives and properties of those below them. This is really shocking. And as again, as a point of order, the appellant gets the same amount of time as the county's presentations, and you've not allowed that. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to address us? Please. Good morning, Elizabeth Mitchell. I'm the project geotechnical engineer of record for this project. I work for Pacific Crest Engineering. We have, over the past 20 years, done several of these pin pile wall retaining systems for our clients at the tops of bluffs that 
are designed to protect the uh, downslope properties from impact due to soil on our client's property. I can think of two specific ones recently where a terms of analysis was never ever required. Um, it was not considered to be a shoreline protection structure and, and we never provided an alternatives analysis. <coughs> Nevertheless, um, given the processes we've been through with this, this particular project, we did provide an alternatives analysis, which was submitted uh, to you as well. So um, that's been done. We have acted in good faith. The, the Kozlowskis are doing everything they possibly can to protect their downslope neighbors from soil impacting on their property. And I really urge you to consider this project to be approved instead of going back to square one at the planning commission and starting all over again. Thank you. Thank you. And let me just clarify for what I think is not the first time. We can't approve this project today. That what's before us is not an approval or denial of the project. This is a jurisdictional Rocky. We can't approve the project. Okay. What's before us is a jurisdictional hearing. Okay. So no, 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 it's very important. I'm not trying to yell, but I, I, you said you're having trouble hearing because it sounds like to everybody at home, it sounds like I'm yelling at them right now. So I apologize. So I just want to make clear because a lot of the discussions have been about the validity of the project, the approach to the project, the necessity of the project. That's not what is before the board today. That's not actually what was before the planning commission either. It's a simply a jurisdictional hearing as to whether or not the zoning investor. So that's that's what. So it's a narrow finding, and that's just something that's very important to understand. And to Ms. Steinbrenner's point, we've been through this this issue a lot, where people may find um, merits in an argument that's being made, but what's specifically before us from a consideration standpoint is very narrow about whether one of these five. Now, the board could make one of those five findings, right? But um, and then reopen up that process. But that's what's before us. Rocky, you're able to hear me, I assume, on that situation. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm sorry. Then that's not. That, I don't think that's the sound system because a lot of other people can. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna. Move, we are. We're losing order, so I'm just gonna move on. I'm gonna make sure. Is there anybody else I'd like to address this specifically on the jurisdictional hearing? Thank you, sir. I appreciate you waiting. Uh, you've already addressed this, Mr. Britton. Uh, there's another individual coming forward. <laughs> Ms. Steinbrenner, please. Good morning. Welcome. Hi. My name is Dave Escobar. I'm a neighbor below the Kozlowski home. And there's been a significant amount, a massive amount of mud that's come down from that property over the last couple of years. And a retaining wall has to be put up there. The retaining wall would be so much higher than where the ocean could possibly reach, unless there's some astronomical tsunami. It's just ridiculous to call it some obstruction of natural erosion from the ocean. Um, I understand the planning department's asked for some alternative to a retaining wall. Beach drive is long. People have been trying to hold up that wall for that cliff forever. If you look down the cliff, the only thing that's holding it up is retaining walls. There's been many, many retaining walls put up there over the years. I don't understand the objection of him putting up a pier and pier wall. There's just, I mean, you ask for alternatives. What's your alternative? There is no alternative. You have to put a retaining wall up there. That's all I have to say. I appreciate you sharing that. Is there anybody else in chambers before we open it up online? I don't see anybody in chambers. <laughs> Madam Clerk, anybody online? Thank you. Yes. Call and user one, your microphone is now available. Carolyn Garrett, this is very informative here and was a major, major problem. It does seem like, um, just from what I'm hearing, a retaining wall would help. Um, however, as someone mentioned how there are these problems all up and down the coast. Um, I want to, we're in a context here of overall uh, places being built um, 
where it's, it's very problematic. And in terms of the weather and the deluge drought scenario, I want to refer people to geoengineeringwatch.org that talks about patents on weather intervention, weather warfare, so that we are getting very adverse, abnormal fires, et cetera, that are not natural in nature. So we're all living in an environment that is very um, being very destroyed and damaged in many, many ways from the, the radiation, the chemicals, the tsunamis, the geoengineering um, you know, I feel for these people. I, I, it, it, it seems like um, there needs to be a retaining wall for this uh, this particular situation. And then I wonder sometimes why uh, developments are approved in the first place. Going back when it's. Uh, problematic uh, areas too close to the ocean too close to rivers etc anyway uh, that that's my comments thank you ms garrett we have no further speakers chair okay will close jurisdictional excuse me the public uh, comment portion of the jurisdictional area mr jim did you have something else you were trying to add i did just want to identify that the County geologist is present. Should your board have any technical questions related to the requirements? Uh, Jeff Nolan is here. Okay, the county geologist is also available. Okay, so are there any additional comments or a motion from the board? Um, I'd move that we take jurisdictional hearing under um, item uh, the first finding that there's been an error um, and that uh, this is not, in fact, a drilling protection structure as it was not engineered to be one. If there was an error by the Planning Commission who was considering a jurisdictional hearing? Oh, or the, in this case, I suppose that I mean, the zoning administrator, it could be basically anyone in the chain, right? It says zoning administrator. Um, out of the Planning Commission, zoning administrator, or other officer. So that's granting the appeal, the consideration of it would, appeal? It would simply mean that the board would choose to take jurisdiction and that this would move to a jurisdictional hearing at this point. Again, as the chair has outlined, we're, we're only deciding whether or not to take jurisdiction in this case. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that, yeah. And, and so the, the finding of the error abuse of discretion is the, is the interpretation of the code? We need to make a right. finding if this is something we're going to move forward with. Yeah, that, that's what I'm moving. That because it's not under 1610-070-H3F, uh, that this was not engineered to be a shoreline protection structure, but rather a retaining wall, um, that this is not in fact one. Okay, and then I believe that the second portion of this council, please guide me on this, is if the board were to agree with this, then we would make a determination on de novo or remanding back to the Planning Commission for consideration, correct? That's right. So the second part of this, Supervisor Koenigs, would, would be, um, I mean, my recommendation is that that's the direction you want to go, that you should refer the matter back to the Planning Commission for this reconsideration of that specific evidence, and then they would hear it de novo, is that correct? They would They would hear it as instructed by your board. So, 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 it's a little unclear because it, it should literally be sent back to the zoning administrator. I have questions about the planning commission. Uh, when it came to the planning commission, accepting the alternatives analysis or giving a continuance to accept a continuing. This, these aren't supposed to be serial proceedings where a little bit of evidence is given at the zoning administrator and then a little more is given at the planning commission and then a little more is given at the board of supervisors. Right. We have a process. And um, if your board was interested in, in making a decision that staff erred in, in uh, their interpretation of the code, you would be sending it back down with instructions to interpret the code a, a specific way um, as your board is, you know, ha has the ability to do. Can you explain to me, and I apologize for this, I agree with your interpretation of the Planning Commission's 
there was nothing that even allowed for the continuance. And then the, well, there was something allowed for the continuance, but not beyond 30 days, which was one of the challenges here. Um, so explain to me, um, I've completely, absolutely lost my train of thought. And it was let me, like, let me, and let me just, let me just, let me just offer a caution. Let me just yeah. offer a caution as well, supervisor with, 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 with regards to the motion that, um, the code treats something as a shoreline protection structure, regardless of whether it was designed to be a shoreline protection structure, because what we're looking at is whether it's designed, whether or not the infrastructure that you're trying to put in is meant to halt coastal uh, erosion processes. So regardless of whether an engineer says this is or is not designed to be a coastal protection structure doesn't mean that it's not for purposes of the code that our staff is applying. So there is some difficulty and tension in sending something back down to staff and, and telling them um, to interpret it a certain way because the project was not specifically designed to fit within the code. I, I remembered my question and perhaps this is maybe more for Supervisor Koenig, but I would like council to address this. They dismissed it without prejudice. So the, and I recognized the applicant had said that they didn't want to go back through the process. But what is the fundamental difference between the planning commission considering the alternatives analysis de novo and the just restarting the process of the application that would actually be complete with the alternatives analysis because it was dismissed without prejudice already. So it didn't, it didn't kill, our action doesn't kill the project as far as that being considered. Can you explain to me what well, the... Well, one thing is that staff hasn't even analyzed the alternatives analysis or looked at it. And it, it may not be ready for prime time, so to speak, in having the planning commission review it um, straight up because staff may be able to work with the applicant in the event that it is... In the event that it is... Um, the project can be made better. One of the alternatives can be pushed versus another one. Um, you're, in, in a sense, you, you're, you're, you're requesting that the, that, the, that the sausage be made in front of the planning commission um, as opposed to allowing staff to have a look at it beforehand and, and actually assist with the project and potentially make the project a better project that will be approved by the zoning administrator. Uh, Supervisor Cummings, I will come back to you, Supervisor Koenig. Supervisor Cummings? So I had a question related to, because I wasn't aware, and thank you for pointing out that an alternative analysis had been submitted. It seems like at the time that it had been submitted, it was submitted more as a comment on this agenda item. Is that correct? And so, or I'll allow you to answer that. Oh, yes, it, it was. We received it two days ago, so staff has not an opportunity to review. So, so I'm wanting to see if there's a, a way forward here, kind of given the direction I think uh, Supervisor Koenig is interested in going because item number four, um, in terms of our ability to take action on it, says there's significant new evidence relevant to the decision which could not have been presented at the time the decision appealed from was made. Um, I think that we could say that, you know, the fact that there is an alternative analysis now would be grounds for us to support the direction that Supervisor Koenig wants to go in. in but rather than going in under the first um, um, qualification, item number four seems like it could be upheld given the fact that we do have a new alternatives analysis in front of us that staff hasn't seen, the zoning administrator hasn't seen, and the planning commission hasn't seen. And so I'm just wondering, maybe county council can comment on that um, as it relates to our ability to move forward here today. Well, it could have been presented. At the, at the time the decision was made. My understanding based on the record is that there was a determination made by the applicants that they did not want to follow staff's direction that an alternatives analysis be prepared. And then it went up forward with the recommendation to the planning commission that they not take jurisdiction. And the applicants changed their mind and decided that they would submit an alternatives analysis. And then they didn't produce one when they had the opportunity to produce one. So um, item four is there is significant new evidence relevant to the decision which could not have been presented at the time the decision appealed from was made. And I, you know, it's, this is all within the realm of your board to, to decide, but from a legal perspective, I think there are two prongs to that. And I don't see in the record where they've demonstrated they could not have produced that alternatives analysis um, 
when they had the opportunity. Thank you. I'll just, I guess I'll just comment in response to that. Um, you know, the, when this first came before the planning commission, um, the planning commission continued the item to give um, the applicants more time to actually produce um, this alternative analysis. And it's clear that the fact that it's before us today, they in good faith went forward with producing that alternative analysis. And I think that um, to the extent that we can try to help resolve that and acknowledge what they've done and allow staff to work on this and work with the applicants, um, you know, would, would be a way forward that I think, um, you know, would be supportive of both parties. And, and I, I agree, but isn't this, and we're in the technicalities here, but isn't the mechanism for that, that the planning commission dismissed without prejudice. I don't see the, why the board would take jurisdiction. It just means that they would apply with the alternatives analysis and work with staff on what, and that's what, that's what's before us. I feel like we're litigating a case here, like meaning the merits of something that's, that's not what's before us. And what I'm sensing is a board majority that wants staff to review this project with the alternatives analysis or sees merits within there being a protection structure, irrespective of what it's called at that location. That's what I'm hearing as a board majority's desire. I don't think that the mechanism for that is taking jurisdiction. So that's, and I think that council is also implying the same thing. So, but I think that there's still direction here that, I mean, for there to be a consideration of this. That's why I think that. I don't think the planning commission's the right spot for that. I don't think the board's the right spot for that. I think that starting with the alternatives analysis back is the right spot for that. And I don't know that there's an acceptance of jurisdiction with that direction that makes any sense because you're you're sort of in essence, you're not restarting the process. You're just uh, allowing because it was dismissed without prejudice for that to happen. So that's why I'm not supportive of taking jurisdiction because I don't think that's the right mechanism. And I would also add that, you know, um, to to speak to Mr. Heath's um, assertion about kind of the the sausage making and the fact that it would likely be an iterative process because we would need to not only do the analysis but then look at the preferred option, be able to review that, and then findings would need to be made for either approval or denial. And so it's not just one, you know, submission of an alternatives analysis and everything else is tied up. There's, it, it is the processing of the permit as um, supervisor friend mentioned that would be more holistically served by, you know, actually reviewing it from the beginning as um, an application and providing those recommendations to the ZA. Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Um, so in, again, in looking at the reasons that the board could um, enumerate for taking jurisdiction, I mean, item five seems to give us a fair amount of discretion. It says there is either error, abuse of discretion, or some other factor which renders the act done or determination made unjustified or inappropriate. Could, I guess a question for county council, um, could the board say that that other factor was, um, you know, a significant question that the board wants to consider of whether or not this is a shoreline protection structure? Yeah, you could do that, or you could say um, um, another an other factor was that you know your opinion is that the planning commission should have continued to give them an additional continuance after they gave them the first continuance which i question whether they were able to do to do that at all but that would that was um that is something they did and you could say that's a factor i mean there's room for the board there's room for the board to make a decision um uh to take jurisdiction if it if it decides that there was another factor the challenge that i have supervisor koenig is what are we going to consider? I mean, we, we're not that, that that would that would portend that there's a discrete decision before us, an alternative analysis that we already understand and agree to, that we are then making a finite decision on. What we're dealing with now is an unvetted process that would come back before us, a debate about which is the best process from both their experts, county experts, and everybody else, and then a, then an up or down decision on the board to determine what that is. I think that the best place for this, because again, I think there's a board majority with interest that this be considered, is back at the county staff level, which means we, because people are gonna view as denying jurisdiction, meaning we don't support the project. That's not, that's not what I'm here to say. I think that there's a value to something occurring at this location. I don't consider myself to be 
the only expert in what that decision shall be. And I would rather have that go through a process. And then if it's for some reason it's denied, right, then we have a finite decision to determine whether or not at that point. But I, I'm not comfortable with this being something we take or the planning commission takes with that undefined of reality. That's why I'm not supportive of the jurisdictional area. Uh, I certainly hear what you're saying, uh, Chair Friend, that you feel that um, to some extent it makes more sense to put it back in the hand of the planning experts or staff who we've hired to do this kind of work. Um, I, I think what should be considered, I mean, and the reason why I was, you know, to some extent think there's merit in us taking jurisdictional airing uh, or, or taking jurisdiction is just simply to express to the public that we take um, their safety very seriously. So um, if we were to send it back to staff, could we include some uh, uh, in the motion that it be um, processed within a certain time frame to ensure that, um, you know, again, we are that rather than, I mean, I think the concern of the applicant is that this is going to go back into limbo and may not be resolved for, for a long time. And that's why they preferred for it to be, we're asking for it to be resolved at the board. I mean, could we include in our motion that it be resolved within whatever, 60 days or something like that? Yes. Uh, uh, um, yes. And a, a, a compromise in, in the various arguments may be that you take jurisdiction and return it to the zoning administrator for consideration of the alternatives analysis in conjunction with staff's analysis. And, and you basically redo the zoning administrator hearing it, with consideration of the uh, alternatives analysis rather than just denying jurisdiction, which would have them start the entire process over again with a new application. Does that make sense? So, so we would take jurisdiction, but Within that jurisdiction, refer it to the zoning administrator. Yes, with instructions, with instructions to consider the alternatives and well, alternatives analysis and work with staff to uh, present the item um, for consideration. Yeah, I'd be comfortable with that. And it, it would come back to us. Not necessarily. It would not necessarily come back to you because the project <laughs> may then be approved, um, and then that would be it. Okay. So we still need to articulate in your motion, though, because you recommend it taking jurisdiction under some mm -hmm. factor, whichever one it is you choose. But then we need to show where it goes at that point as part of the motion. I'll come back. That's super. Right. I think we could do that under certainly item five, you know, some other factor. Okay. And you, you would like to remand it to the zoning administrator? Yeah. Supervisor Hernandez, you seconded that motion. Are you comfortable with that amendment that he just made to that motion? Yes, uh, and if we can get an update as well. Supervisor Cummings, please. You're good. I think I'm okay. I, th I think um, Supervisors um, Bonag and Hernandez may be having a date or a timeline because if it's just sent to the zoning administration, to your point, um, that's, that's open ended. So if you wanted to have a timeline on it, maybe suggest trying to add something in. And I don't know if it comes goes before them in 90 days or 60 days or six months, but just wanted to provide that opportunity. If you if you want to see this expedited, then it might be worth putting some kind of timeline on it. Yeah. And I I would also note um, that in addition to the time it would take for staff to analyze it, if there are other clarifying, because we never got to the point where we were actually reviewing the alternatives analysis and then carrying, you know, the design review and such forward for the final preferred option and then creating findings. There may be clarifying information. It uh, you know we're outside of the PSA necessarily because we kind of have this artificial you know remanding back. We need some amount of time to not only review the information, but if there's additional information that we need, request that information. That may have its own time frame. So um, just considering that in the overall uh, time frame, you know we would we would hope to have something reasonable in that. Can you help guide what you determine yeah. is reasonable? So I, I would say, um, you know, four months, something like that from here. Do you want to set a, a closer time with an understanding that there may be a back and forth or how would you like to do it? Because I think that there's... May I? No, oh. please go ahead. One sec. I mean, in my mind, I think more like 60 days makes sense, but... I'd be interested to hear, certainly from 
the applicant. Okay, just well, just briefly because we have closed this part, yes. please. Um, Timeframes. The planning commission gave us a continuance, thirty days to produce the alternatives analysis. We showed up at that meeting and said we couldn't meet that time frame. We'll have it in four days. Okay, and they denied us. Staff is yanking us around. We are being abused here. Put a thirty day okay. time frame on this. This is crazy. Okay, so all right. Going back to Supervisor Koenig, what time frame would you like to put on it? Um, understanding that it's been submitted, but it hasn't been considered, and there isn't, a, and there could actually be a time frame of a back and forth where some of the delays and county staff directed. I mean, we have to honor that. But how would you like to look at the time frame? I mean, I think thirty to sixty days makes more sense. I mean, maybe if. I mean, if that the most expedient way is to direct it back to the planning commission with it, they I think the zoning administrator makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and our our review of an alternatives analysis could be completed within thirty days. Um, and so I think the thirty to sixty day time frame makes sense. The reason why I said four months was only because if there is a request of other consultants to produce, Work as you can see, the alternatives analysis took a month. They have they have timeframes and workloads, and maybe we can um, look at it and and in that from that perspective, thirty to sixty days provided no additional information is required. Um, there's an opportunity to update your board as well. Um, should that be um, an for you? Okay, Supervisor Hernandez, you had something you wanted to add or no? Thought you had a point to raise. Well, no, you know, I'm I'm just concerned with the uh, winter storms coming and and with you know, uh, mm -hmm. Nino storms coming, and I'd like to see the project ex expedited. You know, I I'm fine with the uh, 30 to 60 days. I'd prefer 30 to 45 days, but I'm fine with that as well because uh, you know it is a, a concern for. I mean, I, I see that as well. So we got to protect homes and lives as well. And Supervisor Cummings, no, oh, okay. So 30 to 60 days. So we have a motion for accepting jurisdiction under item five, which is that there was an error, either an error, abuse of discretion, or some other factor which renders the act done or determination made unjustified or inappropriate to the extent that a further hearing before the board is necessary. Uh, remanding it to the zoning administrator uh, with direction that it be heard within 30 to 40, 30 to 60 days. There's a, a motion from Supervisor Koenig. There was a second from Supervisor Hernandez. I'm not trying to ignore you, Supervisor McPherson. Did you have anything you wanted to add to this before we move on? No, a great, um, understandable discussion. I just, uh, the, the cost factor to the applicants, do they are they gonna bear much more cost in this process then? Or are the facts before the Zoning Administrator Planning Commission or whoever that they don't have to go to put a lot more money into this? Um, They've already gone through a lengthy process. Um, they, they're, this is an at cost project that's been processed in that manner. So they would be charged hourly for staff time. But um, given that, you know, we've already had this review in process, there wouldn't be, you know, um, redundant costs in that sense. Okay. Okay, I, I'm supportive of where we're going. Um, I'm just concerned about putting more burden on the applicant but, uh, at this point. But I'll, I'll support the motion as made. Supervisor Cummings. And I just want, for clarification, I know that um, you'd said that it go to the zoning administrator between you know, for 30 to 60 days. Is there also direction there that it go to staff as well for their analysis? I was just wanting to clarify the. Motion the staff has the alternatives analysis. They would have to provide a recommendation on those findings or a preferred within that time frame in order to meet the hearing date. So okay. it'd be much less than thirty to it would be thirty days or less, I assume, for staff's analysis in order to meet the timeline. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Okay, I think we're ready for a vote then, Madam Clerk. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. Kferson. Aye. And friend. All right. That item passes unanimously with that specific direction. I appreciate all of you waiting this morning for that item.
All right, I'll take this next time. Okay. All right, we're going to move on to item 14, which is to consider approving in concept an ordinance amending subdivision A of section 2.02.060 of the Santa Cruz County Code relating to the compensation of the Board of Supervisors and schedule the ordinance for the final adoption on June 27, 2023, as outlined in the memo of the Director of Personnel and the County Administrative Officer. We have the agenda item board memo, the ordinance, and the section 2.02 subdivision A. Ms. Patel, welcome. Good morning, Chair, friend, and members of the board. The Board of Supervisors' salary is reviewed annually each June. Staff have completed the review, and staff recommendation is to increase the salary structure by 2.71%. This adjustment will maintain the board salaries at 62% of the Superior Court judge's salary as established in ordinance. And with your approval today, the item would be placed on the agenda for consent agenda for June 27th. And the change would take effect on August 27th. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Questions or comments from board members? Is there anybody from the community that would like to address this on this item? Madam Clerk, anybody online? Yes, Chair, we do have a speaker online. Call in user one, your microphone's now available. I think that this item should be placed on the regular agenda, not the consent agenda. And um, it's disturbing to me that the county administrative officer is the highest paid person in the county and um, I, I feel like uh, it's, it's not just he's getting too much money. And I feel like the job you are doing is not warranted to have increased um, compensation or, or salary. I just see more and more approval of what's toxic in terms of everything, the cell towers, the 5G, the antennas, everything. Um, I'm agreeable to pay taxes and I pay plenty for what I think benefits the public, but... Um, even my cat here agrees with me. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garrett and your cat. This item is on the regular agenda, which is why we're hearing it right now. Um, so closing public comments, seeing nobody else in chambers, there's nobody else online, right, Madam Clerk? No further speakers. Make sure that the cat gets recorded for a comment on that item. If we could move it back to the board for a motion. I'll move the recommended actions. I'll second. We have a motion from Supervisor Koenig and a second from Supervisor Cummings. We got a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Chair Friend? Aye. And we do have one additional item, which was the pulled item 87. As a, as a reminder, I, I have to recuse from this item because it's a rail-related item. So I'm going to hand this item over to uh, Vice Chair Cummings to handle 14.1. All right, item 14.1 is approve amendment to agreement with RRM Design Group for the Rail Trail Segment 10 and 11 project, increasing compensation by $322,740 for a new not to exceed toll amount of $3,482,366 uh, contract and take related action as recommended by the Deputy CAO and Director of Community Development and Infrastructure. Um, this item was pulled by Supervisor Hernandez, so I will turn it over to Supervisor Hernandez for any uh, questions or comments that he may have, and we'll open up to the board for any questions or comments the board members may have. So my question about this item was having to do with the, some of the language, right, and regarding the ultimate trail versus the alternative interim trail configurations. And my question is, does the alternate interim trail uh, option bring forth any potential for rail banking or rail abatement into play? And my second question is, will the $67 million active trans transportation program grant uh, that we have for this, uh, for segments 10 and 11, permit for the interim trail about the active trail, sure. bimodal transportation? All right, thank you for that 
question, uh, Matt Machado, uh, director of CDI. So the grant that we received, the 67, almost 68 million is to build just the ultimate trail does not include uh, the uh, the scope of the interim trail. And so in the board letter, we tried to describe uh, that the expanded scope is really focused on the NEPA compliance for the ultimate trail only and does not include the interim because the interim is not funded through that grant. Um, and I know there's a little bit of scope increase for the interim trail. Uh, it's about 5% of the total amendment. And all that does or what that does is it allows flexibility for future consideration if RTC so chooses that. It doesn't change the rail banking situation today. It just includes that a, a little bit additional scope for uh, CEQA compliance so that in the future, if that were considered, it would still it would have been covered by CEQA, but not by NEPA. So there is no funding for that interim trail as proposed today. So the vast majority of this amendment is to address the NEPA requirements for the ultimate alternative. Did that answer the question? To a degree, you know, okay. it's the roll of the dice, I think, but yeah. Are there any other supervisors that have any questions on this item? Seeing none, um, I'll go ahead and open it up to members of the public to see if there's any members of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item. Hi, thank you very much for pulling this uh, off the consent agenda, uh, Supervisor um, Hernandez. I'm Sally Arnold. I'm speaking today on behalf of Santa Cruz County Friends of the Rail and Trail. And we're concerned that the scope of this environmental review is being expanded to include an alternative, which would be constructed as a separate future project by the RTC, independent of, the, of segments 10 and 11. We understand that the scope of the EIR includes looking at both the interim and the ultimate trail designs, even though the county voters overwhelmingly rejected this interim plan last June. But in this case, it looks like you're being asked to abandon the ultimate design on the bridge and only plan for an interim use of the Capitola Bridge. Um, in April 2021, the TPW meetings minutes state rail banking would render our multimodal project a single mode project. This would be far less likely to find funding. And remember, if even a small section of the track is removed or obstructed, uh, you know, and requires rail banking and it takes the tracks out of use. We are concerned that this alternative could compromise the CTC ATP grant for this work, given the change in the definition of the project. And it's not right. Either we should leave the bridge in Capitola alone for the time being, just build the trail segments on either side, or we should study both the interim and ultimate designs for that bridge. The ultimate would then include a new rail and trail bridge, which we understand is you know larger and more expensive than uh, just you know throwing something on top of the existing tracks but it's not right to do one and not the other. So um, we would really suggest that this piece of this, uh, this proposal be, be removed and, and dealt with in another way at another time with more thorough uh, public process than is, is um, being offered at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public here who would like to speak to us on this item? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I just want to say publicly, I concur with Ms. Arnold's comment and ask that you follow her request. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Um, are there any members of the public online who'd like to speak to us on this item? Yes, we do. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, yes, I agree that uh, this should be rejected and the request of Ms. Arnold followed. And I have a related question. I've heard and understand a lot of trees are being cut down along this proposed rail trail. And that that's not good for the environment to be removing trees everywhere. It's just fast and, and 
also on the Highway 1, everywhere I go, it's just heartbreaking. And the trees and the phytoplankton are the lungs of the earth. What could you elaborate on what is happening with the trees? Because I think most people who wanted a rail trail did not want to see clear cutting along that rail trail. Uh, can someone respond to that? I'm. Um, this isn't good to be cutting trees everywhere. It's disastrous. Yeah. Matt, your microphone's now available. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman, friend, and members of the board. Um, I'd like to support uh, what uh, Sally Arnold said. I'm also on the board of board, and I'd just like to highlight that in discussions with several staff members, at the county that it's clear that this alternative project feasibility is doubtful given the lack of any identified funding and the potential for appeal for legal challenges presented by the proposed rail banking which is required i urge your board to reaffirm its support for the ultimate trail alignment project which is currently funded by the ctc and state that the board in including this hybrid project alternative to address the legal requirement that an environmental re report includes an evaluation of potential alternatives, which will help protect the integrity of the document and defend it against potential legal challenges. Um, to imply that a project could be pursued in the longer term by a different agency while not compromising a project which has received funding based on grant conditions, which would preclude the construction of the proposed alternative project seems at the least confusing and at worst a threat to that grant funding. Thank you very much for your time. Rosemary, your microphone's now available. Okay. Okay, my name is Rosemary Sarka. I think we lost you, Rosemary. Thought I did that. Okay, great. My name is Rosemary Sarka. I am a corporate officer of Roaring Camp Railroad, and I'm authorized today to speak for the company and also on behalf of Progressive Rail. I want to note that in relationship to this issue, uh, the two railroads met just last week with representatives of the county and also of the RTC to discuss uh, segments 10 and 11 in great detail. Uh, they went over with uh, cooperative spirit on all sides, the drainage issues, the access issues for pedestrians and bikes. Um, so an extensive meeting that was very well, uh, the, the tone was wonderful and friendly, and yet nothing about this came up in that connection. And I, I want to note that our priority is, has always been the repair and preservation of the rail line. So to that extent, we object strenuously to the diversion of resources in any way from that. Thank you. Barry, your microphone is now available. Uh, thank you, uh, Board of Supervisors, and I want to echo what Ms. Arnold um, said and what uh, Rosemary Sarka explained. And I've been wanting to point something out for the longest time, and that is that I, re I remember being in Watsonville on June 14th, 2018, 
when a suggestion was made that turned into a motion to allocate $50,000 to study designs for a new Capitola rail and trail bridge. Later on June 3rd, 2021, for some reason, the RTC rededicated that 50,000 to study conversion of those bridges into an interim trail in Capitola. It seems like a, a, a terrible mistake, a waste of funds, and we've never been able to do that at preliminary study of a new crossing. What we really need to do is have, begin to look at a new rail and trail bridge as described as a solution in the uh, Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Plan. And we keep uh, sidestepping that, it seems. With regards to this item, uh, the idea for me, the idea of including something like an interim approach use of the, those bridges um, destroys the parity between a uh, CEQA comparison between two approaches because you're not doing anything for the ultimate trail that would cross uh, Soquel Creek. So we would have, uh, a, a, it, it just feels like there'd be an unnecessary advantage to the interim approach. Um, and finally, I'll just reading from this item, a hybrid alignment is required to be analyzed as a standalone design option because CEQA guidelines and get this, require a stable project description and therefore would not allow some portions of the trail to be developed as the ultimate trail configuration and others to be developed as the interim trail configuration, which right there seems to tell me that you, you need to keep uh, the conditions the same as they are right now. Thank you. We have no further speakers. All right, thank you. Um, so I'll bring it back to see if there's uh, county staff wants to comment on any of the things that they heard. Um, I have a few more questions too as well. So maybe I'll we'll start with county staff and then we'll okay. turn it back to you, Supervisor Hernandez. Sure. Um, I actually would like to uh, invite our project manager Rob Tidmore is on the is on the call, and so I think uh, he could address some of the original questions and even some of the comments that we've heard today. So. Rob, are you on? Is he? Okay. If if we can. All right. Good. Thank you. Yes. Good morning. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. My name is Rob Tidmore. I'm a park planner for with the County of Santa Cruz Parks Department. I'm the project manager for uh, segments 10 and 11. And I'd be happy to uh, speak to any of the, um, the questions that you would like answered um, this morning. I'm wondering if um, you may be able to provide any comments on some of the um, concerns that were brought up by members of the community related to the two trail options. Um, and I, I, it sounds like there's some concern about the ultimate trail not being on the trestle and just being on the streets and then um, the funding for the interim trail on the trestle currently. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to, um, I'll, I'll give a, sort of a, a brief overview of, of what the 1011 project is looking at, which I think will help answer some of these questions. So um, I think as, as the board and the public are well aware, uh, the segment 1011 project is currently analyzing two uh, alignments for the rail corridor, um, both at an equal level of detail. Um, the first is the ultimate trail, uh, where the trail is built next to the rail line. And then the second is an interim trail, where the trail would be constructed uh, in place of the existing railroad tracks that is being um, analyzed as an optional first phase to the ultimate trail configuration. Um, in the Capitola Village area in particular, um, the, the, um, the difference between the ultimate trail and the interim trail is that the, um, there is no ultimate trail proposed over um, the existing Capitola Bridge. And there's there's two uh, really important reasons for this. The first is that the the nature of the, the wood trestle bridge uh, at the Capitola trestle means that it cannot support uh, a cantilevered trail bridge like was done uh, at the San Lorenzo River. Uh, and the second is that there's limited right of way uh, in the area for a standalone trail bridge. And so really the, the only feasible way to uh, construct a, a trail bridge over the Capitola uh, tra uh, village area is to build a new combined rail and trail bridge. Um, as you can all imagine, that is a very large um, expensive undertaking that uh, both the county and the RTC felt was better suited to be a standalone project. And that, that 
uh, option for providing a trail service in this area is currently being studied as part of the uh, the RTC led passenger transit project. Under the interim trail configuration, um, the RTC had had commissioned a, a study some years back, which Mr. Scott mentioned in his comment, to look at what it would take to convert the Capitola trestle to to a trail structure. And so, using that information, um, the the interim trail alignment analyzed as part of this project is looking at um, converting that structure to bicycle pedestrian use. So. So the vast majority of the uh, engineering and design work and the environmental analysis um, for the interim trail um, over the Capitol Trestle is already included as part of this project scope. So really all we're doing as part of this amendment, it's a very small, it's roughly 5% of the amendments cost in front of the board today is to do some minor engineering and design work to link up the ultimate trail with the, the interim trail in this, in this location. Um, and um, and some of the other questions revolved around um, the county's $67.6 million ATP grant. And I just want to clarify that um, neither of the um, bridge options in the Capitola Village are proposed as part of this grant scope. So um, Matt mentioned previously that the grant application that we submitted was for the ultimate trail project. That is correct. Um, and in the Capitola Village, under the grant scope, there is a um, there's a break in the multi-use pathway where trail users would um, use the existing on-street bicycle and pedestrian sidewalks, starting from uh, the intersection with uh, the Opal Cliff, or excuse me, the Cliff Drive parking lot to the west of Capitola Village, and then rejoining the trail at the Monterey and Park Avenue intersections. Um, so there is no um, rail or trail bridge or interim trail bridge proposed as part of this ATP grant. This amendment will not change that. Um, it also does not jeopardize uh, the, the grant funding that the, the county was awarded. So hopefully that was um, you know, uh, uh, additional information. And again, if there's other questions that the board specifically wants me to address, I'd be happy to do so. Thank you very much. All right, I'll open it back up to the board, Supervisor Hernandez. So, it, you know, it just seems to me that we, you know, we passed Measure D and, you know, it, it, the voters said, you know, that we wanted to protect the rail, rail lines. And it seems that the, this portion of the interim trail really brings the demise of the rail. Um, I'm going to see if we can bring this back without language that threatens the rail lines. And if we can have discussions with the two rail lines, the two rail companies as well. Um, so I wanted to see if that's a possibility that we can look into. We certainly can do what the board wants to do. I did want to highlight something that Rob said that might have got missed in, in so much of what he said. The RTC is studying the ultimate configuration of the Capitola trestle as part of the passenger transit study. And that will look at alternatives for the that rail system, the rail and trail ultimate system there, which would lead to um, environmental documentation and preliminary design of the ultimate through that section. And so there is adequate studies underway today to look at the ultimate. Uh, through Capitola, uh, I think, but that doesn't, I understand the board's discretion, what they want to do today with this small component of this amendment. I would just say that the vast majority of this amendment is to address federal NEPA requirements. We're on a very, very tight timeline to secure that NEPA approval so that we can pursue construction of the ultimate trail. And so if the board's direction today is to rethink, I would ask that you just rethink that one component and consider approval of the vast majority of the requests so that we can stay on schedule for our NEPA compliance for the ultimate trail, which is funded through the ATP grant. So to remove the interim trail? If that's the board's desire, yes. Uh, I just would, yes, that's, if that's the board's desire, that's correct. But the remainder of the amendment is, is desperately needed. Okay. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. I, I, um, I appreciate the, the, the possible alternative, but I, I think that um, 
I don't see that this is going to kill uh, the rail trail one way or the other. Uh, I think we ought to just go with the staff recommendation, and I would make a motion to that effect. Second. Okay, so we have a motion by <clears throat> Supervisor McPherson, seconded by Supervisor Koenig. Um, I just, are there, I'll open up to board members to see if there's any further comments before I make some comments of my own. Supervisor Koenig. Sure. Uh, I mean, I appreciate uh, Supervisor Hernandez's concerns. I would say uh, this is, a, first of all, I'm not sure that making that the change you're proposing right now is within the scope of, of this item. I mean, even like, you know, under Brown Act rules, if any reasonable person would actually consider the changes that you're proposing uh, in, you know, in line. I mean, is that correct, County Council? Yeah, thank you for raising that issue. Um, you know, your your options today with regard to the contractor, either to approve it or um, or not approve it and send it back to the contractor for further discussions, but not to make changes to the contract unilaterally. Right. I mean, I would also point out that obviously we have discussed this issue at length at the Regional Transportation Commission. I would point out that our second district supervisor who represents the area is not able to participate here, but does have an alternate on the Regional Transportation Commission. I would point out that both of the Capitola council members who sit on the Regional Transportation Commission are not present here. So not only is it legally, uh, I think, dubious to try to change the contractors you're proposing, uh, I think it's simply doesn't make sense without uh, the folks that directly represent the area in the room. I think the contract is, the, the amendments that staff is asking us for are, are, qu are quite minor and as it um, is pointed out, very necessary simply to move the project forward. And so I support the recommended actions at this time. Yep. Um, any other comments by board members? Well, I don't, you know, I don't think it's really drastically changed. It's just removing um, an item from it, from the language of, of this uh, contract. Um, and, you know, I think with the, with the, uh, one of the things that, that I really hold near and dear is this vote of uh, the county vote that we had of Measure D to protect the rail lines. And so I want to make sure that I abide by that on every single vote that I do. Yep. Okay, seeing no further comments, I'd just like to say um, I appreciate the concern that's been raised around um, the interim trail. Um, I would also point out that based on what we've heard from staff and what we've seen in the staff report, we are on a very short timeline. And what I'm most concerned with is that we are going to be able to use this money in a way that's going to get us to our rail and trail um, options and continue to move in the direction that the community has um, signaled by their vote on Measure D. I'd also like to point out, though, that um, the RTC did vote on consideration of the interim trail on the trestle and our actions today are consistent with what the RTC has taken action on. And so to staff's, you know, um, to where they're, they're bringing us to today, this is all based off of previous decisions that have finally gotten to, to this point. I think if we want to consider removing the interim rail, maybe that's something that should go back or interim trail, sorry, maybe that's something that should go back to the RTC. If the RTC agrees that we want to abandon any work on any future work on the interim trail. Um, if that decision is made by the RTC, that will come to our board and we can stop spending money on that. But what's before us today is really us trying to move forward with getting um, the, the NEPA reviews um, that we need to secure additional funding. It's going to help us move forward with being able to start working on the current um, ultimate trail option, which is um, going to really help us move forward. And, you know, I just want to point out we've secured, again, $67 million, and we don't want to compromise that. We want to show that we're going to continue to act in good faith so that we can move forward with this. Because if we delay today, that can actually potentially compromise our ability to secure more funding in the future. And so um, with that, I'm happy to support um, Supervisor McPherson. And I do want to acknowledge what we've heard in our comments today and the concerns raised by Supervisor Hernandez, but I think that if we want to raise those and move away from the interim trail on the trestle, that we should bring that to the RTC and have a discussion about it there. And so with that, I will turn, if there's no further questions or comments, I'll turn it over to the clerk for the roll. Call vote. Sorry about that. Thank you. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? No. McPherson? Aye. Okay, that vote passes. Um, McPherson, Koenig, Cummings in favor, and Anna is opposed. And so we'll, I'll turn it back over to Chair Friend so we can continue with the meeting.
Thank you, Vice Chair Cummings. I believe the last item we have is uh, that we're going to move into closed session. Is there anything anticipated to be uh, reportable at a closed session? Not today. All right. We have a 1.30 budget hearing here, and so we're going to recess into closed session. We'll be back here at 1.30 for a budget hearing.